Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the Archon Team League. Today, I am uh, here with Zelay and Gar, and of course, I am Liquid Monk. Um, Zelay and Gar, it's the first time you've been uh, casting the Archon Team League. First of all, how are you guys doing today? We'll start with Gar. I'm doing great. I'm like very excited for the upcoming match. I'm actually excited for every single match. I just love to watch like every team in Archon League play because everyone is like trying so hard to win. So it's it's very fun. Also, like if people will bring new decks, new broken decks, always nice. And delay. I'm pretty pumped to be here. Uh, I'm really hoping Nylum will lose so that they can be uh, <laughs> tied with us for first place. Yeah, I That's mean, what I'm a lot for. A lot of like the the big teams are playing today. Nylum, uh, of course, is the only team that's three zero, and we have Value Town, who's like doing pretty well as well. Uh, with Kibler probably being um, having the best record so far, so that's certainly an interesting storyline. Um, yeah, just like I, I want to for the intro, I want to get your opinion of like how Archon League has been going so far for you guys. Uh, uh for me or for Gara? Uh, you can well, start. For, all right, I feel like the team league is going well for Archon as a whole, not for me as an individual, but uh, it's a team game, and we're doing good. So I'm definitely happy about that. Two and ones, a, a like you always have to be happy with a two and one record when you're in like playing competitive Hearthstone, and especially in this league when the level of competition is so high. If you're winning two thirds of your matches, you're doing great. So I have to feel really good about it overall. What about you, Gara? Um, yeah, we didn't start off too great, but I think like how we played last week was really good and also like the win and like I'm, I'm enjoying it like to the fullest because like you really push yourself, like especially when you lose, you try to like not give up and like right. win next week. It's like <laughs> a lot of fun. It's like you just, and it's not that punishing the format. You just don't want to finish last basically. Right. Like, yeah. so anywhere but last. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's like the goal. So you you always try, right? Even even if you would be like zero free right now, you would just try to not finish last, I guess. And, and you said an important like thing own. in there. You said an important thing in there, which is um, not focusing on the results so much as on how you played. Like whether you win or lose, if you played well, you should be happy with yourself about that. Yeah, yeah. And we we were just looking at the standings, and pretty much everyone was around the same area. Even though some one team is three zero, all the other teams are either two one or one two, basically. And uh, mm -hmm. it's basically, everyone's like five points with the, each other, with the possible exception of uh, Team Celestial. They'll have a lot of catching up to do later on today. Um, but today, we have to, let's uh, go on to the first match. Let's talk a little bit about Nilem versus Value Town. As you can see, Nilem and Value Town, they're pretty much like the two top teams right now. Just, they've been on fire. Yeah, there's like different storylines. For example, the undefeated Brian Kibler. Like will he? Everyone will be watching him if he will like continue this trend to go eight zero now, and it's... yeah, Nihilum is like first place. Everyone will watch like, will they lose the first match? Stuff like that. Yeah, pretty fun. Well, yeah, before uh, we start this league, uh, before we start this very exciting first match, we have to give a shout out to some of our sponsors. The first of which is the uh, Amazon. Um, basically, if you go to Amazon dot com slash hearthstone you can get um uh, you can buy amazon coins which let you get card packs for much cheaper than you can get them in the normal blizzard store so definitely check them out and uh before we actually go into the first match you mentioned guys that brian kibler is actually the undefeated player in this entire league i believe the only undefeated player with a 6-0 record so i think we have a little video showing off like what he's all about what he can do and his mtg background Uh, I am Brian Kibler, and I'm playing for Team Value Town. Probably most known in Hearthstone for being one of the original players uh, of Mech Mage, as well as the Death Rattle Priest deck that I played uh, to a second place finish in the Sunshine Open, which was the first ever Hearthstone tournament I played. I think the, the format of the Team League is really interesting because it makes people switch up you know, the sort of compositions that they're normally playing in competitive play. Rather than seeing you know, deck, uh, deck lineups that are mostly Warrior, Warlock, Hunter, and those kind of classes, people have to really uh, you know, adapt and try and play different styles. And I think uh, the combined uh, skills of our, of our team uh, will you know, lead us to do pretty well. I, uh, I do play uh, games other than Hearthstone. Uh, I'm actually in the Magic the Gathering Hall of Fame. Uh, you, a few trophies up there that you might be able to see. <laughs> um, and uh, I still compete in major events for that. I uh, play in all of the Pro Tours as well as some of the sort of semi-pro Grand Prix level events. 
I just want to say uh, thanks to all the fans out there who support me and my team. Uh, it's great having you know people who root for me in tournaments, whether it's you know spamming my name in Twitch chat or you know following me on, on Twitter, watching my stream. All of it is awesome, and I uh, appreciate all of the support. Good stuff, guys. Yeah. Kibler, again, he's the only 6-0 player in the league. And I think a part of it is that he's been bringing the same decks every single time. The Shaman deck, his Mech Shaman deck, of course, and his Hunter deck. And people would say that Hunter is like one of the strongest classes in the format. But uh, Shaman's a very unexpected pick, especially coming from Brian Kibler, who um, he's been playing a lot of Mech Mage, but he's just recently, in the last month or so, been switching over to Mech Shaman. Yeah, Value Town's got an interesting lineup here. Um, most teams bring uh, five specific classes, and then it's kind of a hand up, it's a toss up which of the last four they bring. Uh, usually, they don't bring Druid and Shaman. Those are kind of in the bottom four classes, so they don't have Rogue. And what's the? Yeah, I guess Rogue is the normal class. Usually, you see Rogue, Mage, Hunter, Warlock, and Warrior. I think on teams, so it's a little bit interesting. No Rogue. They have both Shaman and Druid. Yeah, uh, pretty much I'd say the value time line, line, lineup is pretty much the same as it was last week, with the exception of Dog um, replacing his Rogue with a Druid. And I'm just wondering like why that might be, because um, I because Nylum is actually known as a team that runs Paladin a lot, and you would expect the um, you would expect Value Town to bring Rogue just to counter like possible Paladins coming from Nylum. Again, from Nylum, we're seeing kind of a mix up again. Uh, instead of bringing Paladin as that like six deck as you're referring to. They're bringing uh, Shaman instead, and you would have to expect that's a mech Shaman. Yeah, and uh, again, Shaman and Druid on, on both sides. So uh, maybe there's a shift in the metagame. Maybe there's some new way of thinking about the Shaman class that suddenly people want to bring it, because I think we've been not seeing a lot of Shaman, right? Yeah, pretty no. much it's just Value Town that's bringing Shaman, and they're bringing mech Shaman every single time. But maybe it's that like the entire league is saying, hey, I would just... The shaman is just such a the mech shaman is going three zero that I just have to bring in and this is really unexpected from Doug bringing mech mage. Yeah, turn two, uh, turn two, one drop, turn one, nothing. Not the start you want when you're playing an aggro deck. Yeah, I mean all right. this this almost looks like a freeze mage hand, right? If you just discount the mechs. Like, you Wait, did he ping instead of balls. playing the cog master? I think maybe he's trying to sell that he's actually playing Freeze Mage instead because Dogs has been playing Freeze Mage in the last um, all three series pretty much of the Archon League, so it just is will be a complete surprise for Tice that this is not going to be a Freeze Age when a Spider Tank comes down on turn three. Yeah, it's not a secret for very long, right? I mean, I guess he could sell it now with the Mirror Entity. That would that might surprise him, mm -hmm. but. I'm really surprised he didn't play the minion on turn two. Usually Hearthstone's pretty easy game, just play those minions, right? <laughs> yeah, especially with like an aggro-ish type of deck uh, like the Mech Mage now. I know a lot of people, like, they really like some of the stats that we were like spitting out last week, so Mech Mage versus Oil Rogue, just I have to put it to you guys. Do you guys play the deck a lot? And if so, like, what do you think the matchup is like uh, percentage-wise? I think it's a close matchup. It's pretty 50-50. I feel like the, I mean, at this point, I feel like the Mech Mage is behind because he's had a slow start. He did nothing on turns one and two. Um, that's really some uh, next level play. The turn two, no minion, just ping face. I, I guess disguising the deck, like you said. Uh, he could have continued with that way of thinking with the Mirror Entity, but now he's playing the Spider Tank. Um, for, me to, for me, it's very interesting. Like I'm thinking, where do you think he decided to bring a Mech Mage in the first place? Like it doesn't seem like to counter like too many decks in the Arkham format. I think it might a lot of be... players... Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, well, it might just be to throw them off, right? Like, you're expecting Freeze Mage, so you show up with Mech Mage. It throws them off this week because they mulligan and prepare for Freeze Mage, and it throws them off in yep. future weeks because they're not as confident preparing for Freeze Mage when they would like to be. Yeah, it's oh, a very it's good like, It's like the um, Assassin's Blade Rogue, which is becoming more popular. Yeah, it's uh, like kind of like the Mr. Yagoot Rogue, and I think one of the reasons they're deciding to bring Tice with the Mr. Yagoot Rogue is that last week when Nylum faced Liquid, they faced a, a Rogue versus Freeze Maze matchup in which they pretty much lost because they brought the, the more standard type of Rogue without Assassin's Blade. 
And if they had gotten Assassin's Blade with like a few oils on it or a few poisons, I think that deck is much more favored against Freeze Mage. So it's probably a good pick from Nihilum to bring a, a rogue that includes Assassin's Blade against Team Value Town, which who brings Freeze Mage every single time. Doc's, Doc's hand is like god awful. Like you really rely on tempo and he has like nothing. He drew like three non max and double frost bullets and mirror entities. It's like terrible hand. Yeah, pretty much, like, we haven't seen Mech Mage in a while, but this is, like, one of the, uh, th like, p possibly, like, one of the worst draws I've ever seen from Mech Mage. Oh my god, both secrets. <laughs> like, sometimes you get, like, double Mad Scientist and double uh, Mirror Entity, but I would argue this is worse. This is, yeah, this is a bummer for him. I guess the reason he didn't play the minion on turn two is he didn't want to run into Coin SI7 Agent. That's a really strong play, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely makes sense. Um, also, like just going back to like the stats, Mech Mage is actually like fairly he heavily favored in this matchup. If you just go by like how things have played out in Black Rock Mountain, and the matchup is actually eleven to five with a sixty nine percent favor to Mech Mage, and I think a lot of that might just be like this. Like a lot of it is like maybe the Snow Chuggers, the Neurotrons that prevent a lot of the weapon damage, which um, Rogue kind of relies on in the early game to deal with threats. I think uh, anytime I hear stats on how Rogue is performing, I have to ask myself who's playing that Rogue. Because Rogue's really a, a tough class to play well. It's easy to make mistakes and never realize it. And so, like, if somebody's like Purple or Firebats playing it, I think you're going to see maybe stronger results from the Rogue than otherwise. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think, like, Rogue, just competitively, it's, if you just go by stats, it's actually, like, one of the worst classes, um, short of only, like, the Taunt Druid and Mid Range Shaman. And like that that's like what you said, pretty much like Rogue is one of the hardest classes to play, along with like Patron Warrior, of course, um, as we all know from Use LA. So it My just favorite. might be like yeah, it just might be that players they're not playing it optimally. Yeah, Rogue has like is like the most interesting class according to stats. Because the stats really don't re reflect as well how strong Rogue actually is or how weak Rogue is. I think that's like most of the Rogue players on that are just lose a ton of games against mm. face hunters that really like ruins the stats and it depends on who plays the rogue right like rook has like one of the highest skill caps from the classes yeah it's very and interesting it like even though it has like the worst stats it's still one of the best decks to bring or one of the best classes to bring yeah i see a lot of people on the forums they're saying that like why is like rogue uh ranked so high in every tier list when we first of all never see it on ladder and second of all just like it doesn't do well when like the normal player plays it. It's exactly what you guys brought up. It's just such a hard deck that most people can't play it optimally. And it's exactly like that with Patron Warrior, where it's like, again, it's a hard deck, uh, but it's not very well represented on ladder. And this it's is like probably like, this is like the first turn where Dog actually has like a decent play. Yeah, that was nice. That's kind of sad. How does Dog turn this around? Like maybe if he draws uh, Antonitis, he can go Antonitis Frostbolt next turn. He's yeah, thinking about actually, whether to play that Cogmaster or not. He's like, mm -hmm. does this overcommit into AoE? It's his last minion. I can yeah. If you just like think about the line, like again, like Nylum, they've brought Druid, I guess, every single time. So this might be like a counter to Druid. But then again, like the Freeze Mage versus Druid matchup isn't, isn't even that bad. And, um,. I just have to say, like, maybe this is just for the unpredictability. Like Gara said, like, you just have to finish not last. You just have to finish in the top seven to advance to the next round. So pretty much uh, if you can, like, just throw off your opponents in the future rounds, this might be, like, worth it to bring suboptimal decks into the uh, regular stage. Right. Yeah. Like, for me, it's always so interesting to see what people bring or how they, like... Um, like the the order of the decks they choose, it's so interesting in this format. Because there's like so many four. different. Yeah, that's, that's crazy. Just a crushing play. It really hurts. This Annoyatron though is uh, really helping to keep uh, the mage alive. That Assassin's Blade would be connecting for what twenty one over three turns, which is too off lethal by itself. Yeah, just too much damage here. And uh, like, it's not like the Mech Mage like really has like too many comeback mechanics. They really don't have any draw cards in their deck at all, besides like maybe one or two Azure Drakes. So like, what Dog has right now is what he's gonna get pretty much. 
He needs Antonitis. That draws some fireballs, right? Yeah. He's got to protect this Anoyatron so that uh, the weapon doesn't connect with his face too much. Lothab's obviously a fantastic card against Rogue. Yeah, uh, 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 that's crazy. He gets to clear here. Push a little bit of damage. Yeah, and possibly that was like one of the best turns he could have gotten, right? Yeah, I like what he's doing here. Turns like that are how he wins this game. Yeah, and he doesn't have a Blade Fury, so that's like... All he can do is play his own low time. Man, if he picks up a fireball, it, this could be over. <laughs> this guy's toast. Yeah, exactly. Well, he's, like the he, thing is, like, he's only he's already used one fireball, and he's used both frostbolts, or he has used one frostbolt, and he has the remaining Whoa. one in his hand. Whoa. Fellow Reaver, that's interesting. <laughs> that's something new. That's going to get big game hunter if he plays it, which is uh, <laughs> really not like, what he's looking for. Does, can can Doc pick up a tell? Like, would he uh, would have Tice Blade Fury last turn if he had it? Like, it would be just seven mana, so he could do it. He could have cleared mm -hmm. the board with a Blade Fury. So, if you Frostbolt's face, that would be like a play where you uh, like where you know that your opponent doesn't have a Blade Fury, so you could push in like more damage. I'd like, be, I'm expecting him to play the Fell Reaver here and get wrecked. I'd be surprised if he didn't. That'd be like uh, yeah, some but Frostbolt is the better play, right? Frostbolt face, like a higher chance to win. It's like a play to win. Frostbolt face. Very well, just get zab. Yeah, I think uh, from our perspective, Frostbolt face is probably slightly better. I'm Again, just saying, like, for last turn, if he had no the big game hunter, it's obviously way better. But without knowing about the big game hunter, the Fell Reaver, I think, makes a lot of sense. I would, I would expect to zap not a big game hunter, obviously. Big game hunter is crazy. Mm. If he would have frostbolt face, he could have set up lethal. Yeah. And you know the other thing right now is that because the Fell Reaver is on the board, um, if Tice is so confident that he can just win this game, he can just use as many cards as he can and then reveal Dog's yep. entire deck. Your prep is crazy in this situation. How many cards does he get to burn here? So he get to play his entire hand? So he gets to play six cards, burning 18. Yeah, and that just How many might cards be does that leave in the deck? Probably not many. But if it's more than oh, Antonitis is gone. That's so Did we crazy. Any fireballs? Uh, he's used one fireball. He hasn't burned any yet. And there's the second fell reaver. Yeah. That's so nice. We see that dead deck here. A dog just shaking his head. <laughs> Watching all his dreams go down. Yeah, uh, he's not gonna uh, love seeing this last card either. Yeah. You know. That's a pretty, actually a pretty smart pick from uh, from Team Nilum because they brought they're bringing BGH against. Uh, you would have to think like Trump is bringing Hamlock, Kibler is bringing Mech Shaman, which has around four BGH targets. Yeah, and this is just completely. This is such a that is brutal. such a crushing win. Like you don't just win, but you also like reveal the entire deck, reveal the pepperonis. Because they can try and uh, bully this Mech Mage right over the course of the series. Yeah. And you know, you have to remember that there is, of course, a bench rule uh, instated in Archon League, which means that if Dog queues up again with either his Mage or his other deck, and he loses he loses with that deck, then Dog cannot play unless one of his teammates wins another game. So it might be a consideration that Dog might not be one of the best players to send out in the next match. Do you guys like consider that early when you're picking uh, players? Or is it just like, hey, the early game or the early few matches doesn't really matter as much? Uh, every match definitely matters. You're definitely thinking about that. Uh, you're willing to queue a player who's lost, but you're less likely to do so is the way I see it. What do you think, Gara? Yeah, I, I can't really reveal the strategy, but it's obviously something you have to consider every time because, yeah, especially early. Maybe actually later on, it's a bigger deal if someone gets benched because it's mm -hmm. easier to counterpick. Like if someone, like one teammate has already two wins, right? And then you get benched, it's like very easy to counter pick the last two decks. Yeah, you definitely don't want to get benched at that point. It's something you consider, but when you really think about it, when your opponent expects you to like change to another player, then it's probably better to keep on playing and really hope you win the next match. It's like the mind games, right? Yeah, pretty much. And let's, uh, going back to just all the classes that were selected, um, you would have to think that Rogue 
I guess Rogue like might be one of the weaker decks um, against Value Town, so it was kind of expected, or it's really nice for them to get it out of the way. Uh, Hunter, depending on what version it is, it can be favored against Rogue. Um, Shaman and both the Mech Shaman and the Mech Mage, I would argue, would, would be slightly favored. And I would even argue that the Druid uh, would be favored in terms of stats. But of course, again, Rogue dedicated players like Dog, Fire, Bat, Purple, they would argue that the Rogue is favored against anything. All, but All the little things are so interesting to me. For example, that uh, you decided to play Shaman over Paladin, for example. Like, he's very convinced that Agro Paladin is like the strongest Agro deck right now. And then, like, pick if this is Mech Shaman, which we obviously expect, right, from Adio. Like, why would you pick a weaker aggro deck over your stronger one? Like, he must have yes, changed his mind, right? About what the strongest deck is. Yeah. I think it's, it, it's right. Yeah, it also might be that, I guess, Mech Shaman and Agro Paladin have, like, slightly different matchups in how they play out. I would argue yeah, that, yeah. like, Mech Shaman is a lot better against Druid, for example. Um, but oh, maybe that's the, that's uh, not true. But the, like the yeah. the clear matchups, in my opinion, are Patron Warrior and Rogue, because like a, a Mech Shaman is much better against Rogue than than Paladin. Like pa Paladin is like unfavored against that, and Palad and Paladin is bad against Patron. Like if they have a will and usually you lose, but Mech Shaman is like coin flippy. But Druid yeah. is pretty even. Like I played like a lot of aggro decks. That's why I know. They both okay. beat up Druid. You think? Yeah, I really beat. agree. With I agree with what you're saying about um, Mech Shaman being better against the Rogue and the Warrior, and we're seeing a lot of that in this league, so it makes it's, sense. It's mainly Doomhammer, right? Because Rogue can't really deal with it. You don't have taunts, and usually you just like combo minions on board with like backstab and stuff. But mm -hmm. if you just play a Doomhammer and hit him for like 16 damage, and then re uh, remove the board because Rogue doesn't play too many minions, it's actually pretty easy to kill the minions from Rogue. You just deal damage every turn, right? Like a lot of damage. So you just yeah. race him. That's yeah, why, I but Paladin has to uh, get board control. I feel like uh, no matter what the aggro deck, this is kind of the weak of the aggro decks because uh, at Dreamhack of Lencia over the weekend, um, the two D Dignitas brothers, uh, the uh, Green Sheep and Blackout, they both made the finals with pretty much like both played two aggro decks and Page and Warrior. And uh, so like I think a lot of teams because of that result are respecting the aggro decks slightly more. Yeah, I played there, like I got into a top eight. And I played against Grim Sheep. He just had like the, the stronger aggro lineup. It was like a mirror match basically, but he had the stronger aggro decks. Oh. Here's and the really like exciting one. Here. I'm yeah. I'm looking forward to this. Uh Kibler with Shaman. Kibler's undefeated. I think Shaman's favorite against Warlock. I really want to see Life Coach go down. This can be good. Oh, why why do you want to see Life Coach go down? Are you uh are you trying well, to race for like the top placing or do you just want yeah. to cheer against Nalum, basically? <laughs> Well, yes. I mean, Nylon's the one team that's uh, beaten us, right? So I definitely need to see them go down. Yeah. And you know what? Even though Nylon has a 3 0 record, it's, they're, they're, having, like, they're winning like 6 5 every single time. So like, their score differential isn't as high as like, you might expect. So if they lose one match, they can just get sent straight to something like fifth place, basically. Ooh, that sounds good to me. I like this. <laughs> Kibler's undefeated, and he's got a favorable matchup. Everything's perfect here. So if Kibler wins this, what's his record in the league? Does that make him 7-0 in games? Yeah, 7-0, which is pretty uh, pretty wild, especially because I think a lot of players going in, or a lot of like viewers going into Archon League would maybe peg Kibler as like one of the weaker players because he hasn't done too well in tournaments, especially like... The Kingwin Pro League, for example, where he finished somewhere in like the bottom two or three of his group. You know what's the best part? I probably hasn't changed the Shaman list in all weeks. Like he's so playing the coach, same list and just owning it up. Life Coach yeah, exactly. kept that big game hunter, right? He's expecting Fell Reavers. Oh Looks yeah, like definitely. it might pay off for him in this game. Yeah, Wait, I wonder he kept if he, it? Yeah, he kept the big DGH. That's crazy, and he, right? And he didn't dark bomb the cog. He wants to save it for like a Zapomatic. Yeah. I think like uh, usually. Yeah, yeah. I'm just saying, like, usually when you have like Zapomatic and Mech Whopper, you try out to bait out the Dark Bomb with the Mech Whopper because you don't really have a crazy curve, anyways. And then if they do it, they get wrecked by Zapomatic. Sometimes you get those crazy turn three, turn four kills with Zapomatic against Handlock because they have to life them. To yeah, get we all final. remember that dream hack where uh, Firebat got a turn three kill, right? I had also one in Valencia. 
Power oh, nice. Mace into Zapomatic, Rockbiter, Flametong, dead. Yeah, and that's just something about Mech Shaman. It's just, it can be so good sometimes. You can just steal those early wins. And, I think uh, I actually have a 100% win rate with Shaman in tournaments, somebody told me. Because I think I've played like one or two games with it. <laughs> nice. Just got there every time. You can never play Shaman again. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, and Thank then you. they release like Quarter Master for totems. <laughs> it's coming. So what do you think about this Hellfire? You have to. Or yeah, you're dead. nine damage off the board. That's if if Zapomatic, at this life total, if Zapomatic lives, you're dead. He doesn't even need so much. Like, Rock by the Cracker will be enough. With the he other stuff. He literally dies if he just plays Mountain Giant. Yeah. Oh, he's thinking about... he. Nah, you can't be greedy. Not against Zapomatic. Against everything else, but not against Zapomatic. It's like the craziest thing. So Rock he's, like no him. he's always going to think about it, right? He's not going to do yeah. it, but he's going to think about it. Yeah. We simply Hellfire. He really wants to get his Molten out every game. Yeah. He keeps it in every matchup. Like, he keeps Molten against Control Warrior as well. How, oh, really? <laughs> yeah, it's I've crazy how, never how seen he thinks. That. And now, like, Life Coach can possibly actually stabilize fairly easily with uh, the BGH that he kept in his opening hand. Actually made a huge difference. And I think it actually makes a lot of sense because you don't have to think Life Coach probably practiced his matchup for Archon League, um, especially since he knew that Valley Town would be his team's next opponent so if, if you get a fell reaver on the board and pretty much handlock doesn't have a bgh like what can they really do they just die right if the eight damage connects the face you have to think that the mech shaman also has some burst in his hand and when you're sitting at 16 life total if life coach oh. didn't have the bgh he would just like be dead yeah this, so this is that mold decision is, really paying off but this is a difficult turn i would just totem up you need spell power totem like if you get spell power totem, you have a pretty good chance to win. But you totem first, obviously, before you flint them. Doesn't matter. Um, I wonder if it would be because you expect turn five sludge belcher. I, I wonder if it's like better to get the rock biter out as well, because you have already a lava burst, crackle. If you just play sludge belcher, it's ten life. Um, you have uh, at least so like 50% to kill him if you don't get um, s uh, yeah, a, s a roll of totem, like 33% to get a spell power totem because totem totem will survive if you don't top deck like another spell. Okay. So I would yeah. went for the rock by It's just likely, even if he has Molten Giant, it's likely he plays Molten Giant uh, Sludge Belcher and not Molten Giant Heal Bot because you have a board, right? So he can't clear and taunt up and heal everything. Yeah. So, so it was a turn, misplay, I think. This That's turn, it's like play. Molten Giant with Sun Fury or Dark Bomb. Mm. Feels so weak, though. Oh my wow. god, it's half. Wow! <laughs> That's, That's life coach for you. That's life coach for you. This wow, he even lets one damage on the board. He's dead, right? Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure he's out of hand. Yeah, he has, he has also the coin. He's dead. Yeah. He needs wow. like no. He doesn't need anything. It's eight. Eight. No, he doesn't. Need. And wow, just really surprising there. I want. And he looks actually very surprised. surprised. You know what's crazy? He looks very surprised about the burst damage. Yeah. What was he expecting? It's Max Shaman. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, and like, if you just think about like the line of plays, if. I think if Kibler actually played the Fell Reaver on curve on turn five, he might have lost because of the swing of the BGH. Yeah. So like really forward thinking. Like a lot of people say that aggro or aggro decks, especially like Mech Shaman, they're like very linear and there's not much decision making um, involved. But that key decision made by Kibler on turn four pretty much like guaranteed him the game right there, which is really surprising. And you know what? Kibler uh, moves on to seven and zero. Oh, uh, getting he he's already the Dragon Master. So he's definitely going for that title of Master of Duels as well. Still undefeated. Easy. Unstoppable. He's just crushing it. Unstoppable. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, who can stop it right now? Like, I'm not sure like if anyone is near even his record. Chalky well, I know was Firebat's probably, like, one off. He's okay, just got one Firebat. loss. So Firebat is 6-1. And I think Chalky, yeah. he's something like... Uh, Chalky last week, he started off with 4-0. He didn't do so well last week. So right now, I believe he's something like five and three, 
And, and like, he, he also, yeah, yeah, he didn't get to play his last deck, right? I think he, he did, but he lost. Yeah. Oh, also, Nyria, how could I forget? Nyria is also at 6-1, and one, uh, getting only one loss with the Rogue. But otherwise, he's been doing really well lately. But Life Coach was really good, like, before he uh, lost this, like, in terms of stats, right? He was undefeated yeah, life... as well last, last week. Uh, life, was... no, Life Coach, uh, yeah, Life Coach uh, got a few losses under his belt last week. He lost to Druid Mirror. He lost uh, Handlock versus Patron, and um, I think he got at least like two or three losses last week. So he's still in the standings, um, but he lost a game yet again this week, so uh, it might not be going the best for him. But you know what? This is like pretty much uh, what this league is all about. Players can bring like the same decks over and over again. They can specialize in these decks, and Kibler having the chance to play Mech Shaman every single week, he's certainly an expert on the deck. I mean, he's doing, like, he's not even changing the list, and people know what's he, what he's going to bring, but he doesn't care. He's just winning. <laughs> yeah. I've been oh, researching gosh. his, yeah, I've been <laughs> researching his list, and uh, he basically has, like, a standard mech shaman, but he takes out the doom hammer and replaces it with, like, a mechanical yeti, pretty much. And oh, it's I see. probably because he's, like, like, in this format, there's a lot of weapon classes. So he's probably really afraid of weapon removal in the form of oozes and harrisons. And we've seen, like, pretty much harrisons in half the decks in Archon League. And it's a funny when you as well. It's a funny when you think about how old the list is like Sixo brought it to Seed Story. And like since then it's like basically the same list. It just changed one card and it's still doing so good. And nobody else is playing it. So now this is uh really two good matchups in a row for Value Town, right? Uh we have the Mech Mage against Druid. This is pretty much again exactly what Value Town wants to this be is, Yeah. That is exactly like Exactly 100% the matchup they want for the for the yeah. Mac Mage. So maybe yeah, they're a little of... bit in Nylum's head for the queuing system, or maybe they're just getting lucky. Uh, probably a little bit of both. Um, yeah. You can't like blame it all on luck or all on skill and right. uh, Hearthstone anytime. When you think but, about uh, the yeah yeah the thing is you you really try to get your win with Druid somehow right and it's like interesting to see like the strategy behind it because they know there's like so many bad matchups for the Druid, so you kind of try to sneak in the win, and they call them with the Mech Mage. Yeah, exactly. And oh, it's usually like Druid is that like six class. Pretty much in this format, every team is bringing like the top three classes, which are Warlock, Warrior, and Hunter. Then they, they kind of think about the fourth class, which is usually Freeze Mage, simply because of the um, the lack of Warriors in this, uh, in this format compared to in their standard Conquest format where one of three decks is Warrior. In this format, it's only one of six decks is Warrior. And then after those four classes, maybe you're thinking uh, Rogue is pretty good, Druid is pretty good, uh, Paladin maybe, but it's always that six decks that struggles to get wins. I remember uh, in Liquid versus... Um, Liquid versus... Who was the second team that we faced? No Wild Growth, uh, no Innovate. Yeah, exactly. No Wild Growth, no Innovate all the time. By the time. It, the the, the Druid like just got swept 0-5. This game is like the opposite of Dog's last Mech Mage game. Now Dog yeah. has a great curve, a great matchup. His opponent doesn't have Innervate, doesn't have Wild Growth. Uh, and he has the I'm wondering, scientist. what's Dog's next play? Like, he could coin Spider Tank into Tinkertown, that's really strong, but getting Scientist out is also really strong against Druid because the Mirror Entity is always a, a real pain in the butt for Druid to deal with. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah, and the Druid's hand is so awful. Okay, he just so wants to hit hard. Good choice. Yeah, yeah. It's a very strong tempo play, right? Getting the the four four next turn is just way too strong. Yeah, yeah. This matchup, uh, we, we've been alluding to that. It's very favored for the mech mage, and in fact, it's the record shows that it's seventeen to twelve with a fifty nine percent win rate for the mech mage. And I think a lot of people, when they're thinking about these stats, um, they would probably expect it to be a lot more favored for the mech mage, but I think in reality, most people overestimate matchups. Um, most matchups are probably like slightly closer than what most people say. Yeah, people like to exaggerate. I think that's a good point you just made. Mm -hmm. um, where are we pulling these statistics from? Like, can we see these somewhere? Uh, they're in my head somewhere. Top secret? Okay. <laughs> can you tell me um, what games are counted for this? It's pretty much every broadcasted game from Black Rock Mountain onwards. Okay. Oh man, this is just needs tinkering? so sick. Yeah, it's 
like pretty much every turn, Dog is developing something, and um, Tice is forced to respond to it. And that's really interesting as well. Tice brought two BGHs in his Druid deck, and we already saw a BGH in his Rogue deck. So I'm just, I'm not really like we. Alluded it's to it's because of they probably targeted the Handlock right because of Trump. Like he brought Handlock 100 of the time. Same for Life Coach. Mm -hmm. So they kind of wanted to get like multiple wins against that, I guess. Yeah, but the it thing can is, still happen. Um, I think it's, Trump's not even guaranteed to bring Handlock this time because Trump is one of those players that knows the value of mixing it up yeah, quite often. I, actually, Trump improved like a lot in tournaments. You could also see it like in the Vulcan League and stuff. Like he mm -hmm. he brought like a huge variety of decks. He also played Rogue, for example, which you would not expect. So like, this is a force of nature turn. We're just going to clear as much as we can. Because we're dying. Yeah. Yeah. We're definitely And you will dead. probably still die. Yeah. <laughs> I, I think, you gotta try, man. You gotta try. Life, of a, life of a druid, man. I you think if... So uh, get so far. Die anyways. If Tice were maybe at like, had five more health, he would go for the Emperor play. Because like you have to come back somehow, and I feel like Force of Nature just isn't a winning play. Yeah, it's really not a winning play, right? Even though you die to so much, because like what's it, what? Like you can't kill the mad scientist. You can't get him on your entity because then you lose like hundred percent sure. Yeah. But but like how do we win now? I like that well, sequencing. He was testing for duplicate. Going to duplicate yeah, the nice. clockwork now. Yeah, I was gonna say, uh, Dog, he didn't have like too much of a play on turn 6, but I think he's pretty happy with this. Like, as long as he gets any minion, and he's able to like buff some of them up with some spells, I think um, this is probably what he wants. He's seen that Tice, he's used a lot of spells already with the swipe, for example, and Force of Nature. So he probably has a lot of clunky minions in his hand that he can't play because of the mirror entity. If he, if he draws like a taunt, like a Sengen, which is probably not in his deck, there's a small, small chance because he will probably like play a BGH, give his opponent a BGH now. Then he will probably play Dr. Swag. And if both bombs hit for one, and then he gets like a series of draw uh, of taunts and he, both fireballs and both frost balls are in the bottom of his deck, there's hope. Wow, Gara just suggested that Boombots <laughs> hit for one. When does that ever happen? I'm just saying that a lot of things have to go right here. So if you're Tice, do you just say this has to be a counter spell for me to win this game and just like play Doctor Boom or? Uh, he had think, to think yeah. about that. He had to think about that last turn where he killed the Mad Scientist. I think it's what like Tice might be thinking is that he um, there's okay. So Tice has three spare or rather Dog has three spare parts in his hand, and if he has like just one card that is just sitting in his hand the entire time. Maybe it's like a Frostbolt, I, and I think that would be the worst case scenario. And if it's a Frostbolt, then maybe as a chance with this board. The okay. saddest part is you give your, your opponent a stronger shade as well with Mirror Entity. That's so unfair. Yeah, that's always, that's always that really sad. <laughs> and you know what? Most of these lists these days, because Mech Mage isn't as common, um, these lists, they don't include Zombie Chows, the Druid list that is. So there's like not really much that you can like run no, Mirror Entity no, uh, into. That's really a big deal. This is a sad moment to be a druid. You have the BGH for Dr. Boom, and it's um, probably not good enough. You know, there yeah. there is a strategy where you basically don't show the second BGH, and then you queue up with this deck again because the stream is on like sort of a delay, and like the um, like the the other team won't be able to scout the second BGH pretty much. Is there any merit to that? Uh. I wouldn't, like, if I were playing the Druid here, I wouldn't be ready to give up on it yet. I'd still want to press buttons and just believe. Yep, yeah, of course, he still does have that BGH, so swing turns are possible. But you have to really? feel like he, he needs, like, a heal bot soon or something. The, and Druids I mean, don't run the, that. That's so frustrating. You can't even hear a power down, down those boom bots. <laughs> <laughs> this game is just sad. Yes. Oh. Step one. We need it's a like, the prophecy I've is never coming true. I've never seen Boombots not going for BGH, right? Those Boombots really hate BGH. Whenever I'm like casting a game or playing, they always go for their BGH. Oh yeah, they went yeah. for the BGH again. Full clear, standard Boombot stuff. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Revenge for their master. This is the only outcome possible, honestly. 
Ooh, shredder positioning. Put it in the middle. Oh, uh, clear misplay. <laughs> That's really gonna change things. Uh, uh gain some no life. The, the, the Probably wanted to taunt. It's a frustrating heal again. We heal for five and it does nothing. Yeah, a lot of uh, like this matchup isn't as common these days, but a lot of the time it was uh, all about Mech Mage getting an early lead and then Druid like somewhat stabilizing at around like three or four health. Then the Mage has to top deck something, but I don't think this is going to be one of those games. You obviously, reverse switch and ping face. Yeah, put him down to one so that you can kill him through a taunt. He has to armor up. And both, like the minion is frozen and the hero is frozen. What can he possibly do? And he can't use spells. And you have time rewinder. It doesn't matter. Yeah, is that like any card? Oh yeah, Deathwing. But if you would put him down to one, he can't even Deathwing. Because he would die to hero power. So dog playing around Deathwing here. And he needs to, the, the Shredder to be a Doomsayer from the Deathwing. Or actually like a zero, zero 05 or something. Zero, zero 03 or totem, whatever. Yeah, and then so Mech Mage. Mech Mage getting a win here, um, and you know, not only do we have to like kind of question the Mech Mage decision, we have to question why did not he, why did he bring Mech Mage instead of Tempo Mage as well? Because I think like ninety percent of players would argue that Tempo Mage is like the slightly stronger aggro mage uh, deck. Do you guys have any insight on that? Um, the, what I know is like I'm not playing on an A, but it's actually getting more popular actually for like two weeks now. Mech Mage or new versions of Mech Mage on an A. You probably not have more insight about that, Zalei. Uh, I don't have much to say about either deck, other than that they're not as good as Patron. <laughs> <laughs> like on EU, you haven't seen Mech Mage for like two months or something, three months, I don't know. It's like that. I see a little bit of everything here and there. <laughs> yeah, I don't think uh, Zalei... I don't think Zalei actually pays attention to the decks that he's queuing into. He's just like... I'm queuing into Patron Warrior. I'm all about Patron Warrior. I don't care it's about just, anything. Yeah, else. it's 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 like Patron and another deck, right? It's like random. Deck. I mean, I have to decide how to tech. Like, do I want Harrison Jones, whatever? But um, I'm not I'm not gonna be scared of these mage decks, like ever. <laughs> Sometimes they I win. Think, it's fine. I think statistically, uh, just like mage does really, or these like kind of mech mages, they do really well against weapon classes. Like, I, when I was compiling like the stats, I was really amazed at how how favored Mech Mage was against Control Warrior. It was like 71%, for example. Wow. And, and like, you wouldn't expect that because, no. like, you would figure it's like a much more even matchup. But I think it's just that, like, the Anuotrons and the, um, the Snow Chuggers, because they really lock Warriors out of turn four for the Death Spite, it actually makes like a huge difference. 71%, like, that's like one of the more lopsided matchups in Hearthstone, then. Yeah, definitely. Like, not like, the most, only... but it's like probably like top five or something. Top uh, I think there's like, no, yeah, top ten is about fair, I think. Um, yeah, I like, think I think like pretty much like you have control warrior versus freeze mage. It's like oh, one of yeah. the biggest handlock versus priest, but yeah, definitely mech mage versus control warrior. It's definitely up there. It's one of those that's like really unexpected. Anyways, I think that was like a huge win for Value Town. Oh, the yeah. the mech mage, like I think we talked about it like last week. There's like decks where you just expect to get wins, like on Patron Warrior or Hunter, and there's like really big wins. And I think like for the mech mage to get a win against Druid is like a, a big one. Yeah. Like a very um, important one. But you know what? Nylum is actually very used to um, coming back from behind. I think in pretty much all of their series, they went down uh, with like a fairly substantial, um, um, not an anti-lead pretty much. Like for example, against Liquid, they were down 5-2 or 2-5. And um, pretty much like everyone had to beat Show's Patron Warrior, which unfortunately they did. In the first week, uh, pretty much it was like up to RDU to like climb back, and he just like couldn't get the last win. But uh, in against the end, Archon, he right? it was like yeah, against six, Archon. Five. Yeah, I don't so want to like, talk about that. So, <laughs> do you think maybe Trump will queue Warlock here because they're expecting to not see Druid out of Nihilum, and so with Dru with Druid being unlikely, Warlock's maybe a little bit of a better pick. It's it's really scary, right? Because they saw the BGH in Rogue, they saw the BGH in Druid. The double yeah. BGH and Druid. Maybe maybe Life Coach has like one BGH in Patron. Like sometimes you see that as well. If that's the case as well. And double BGH handlock. It's really scary. Like, them, 
he might not get a win on that uh, Bullock. And he had yeah, that problem, and he had the problem before with Paladin, right? Like last week, we got like four losses or so with Control Paladin. So there will be like feeling. a déjà vu, a déjà vu. Yeah, and you know what? Life Coach is uh, he's known for handlock, but he's also known for bringing a slightly different handlock list every single time. Not only like every single time to Archon League, but to like literally every tournament, he brings a slightly different handlock. And something like double BGH is actually fairly common for him. Um, not these days, but back in the day when Handlock and Control Warrior were the most dominant decks. I wanna, I wanna see Trump playing Zoom, man. That would be so funny. That would be so awesome. Like the quadruple BGH tags and just yeah. plays Zoo easy. Uh, Zoo Trump is actually weak to BGH. Ah, oh, it's true. There's like a few BGH targets in Zoo these days with uh, Dr. Boom, Melganis, and even sometimes Sea Giants. Yeah, yep. that's true. But he will yeah. not bring those because he's super smart. Yeah. I think uh, actually last year, Trump was actually known for alternating between Handlock and Zoo in every single tournament. Um, this was around the the first WEC qualifiers, I believe. Around yeah, he also time. played Malilok. Yeah, yeah. He really yeah, everything. Exactly. And I think like that's I have to give a lot of credit to Trump. He like he's been winning a lot of stuff. And a part of it is because he's been mixing it up and he's also like been less afraid to bring classes that like he thought were too hard at first. For example, Freeze Mage and Rogue. He's been playing more of those decks these days even. Maybe not in tournaments, but at least on streams. Oh, this is also the first time in Arconic he brings Control Warrior, right? Who's favorite yeah. here? Control Warrior or the handlock? Um, I think it again. It's one of those matchups where it depends who you ask. If you ask a control warrior player, they'll say control warrior. I think like let's show and let's ask, show and yeah, uh, let's ask kids cuts who's favorite here. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. I think uh, show and life coach actually had this debate once where life coach was saying that it's like eighty percent favored for the handlock, and show was yeah. saying it's like almost the same for the control warrior. Right, but, and so uh, I think it's just about tech cards and who's playing and that kind of thing. Yeah, I think it's a close um, matchup. If you want the actual it's stats, yeah. it's uh, 13 and 10 in favor of the Handlock, so 57% for Handlock. Okay. Handlock does have the more consistent draw engine. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, yeah. So I guess like by nature, just because of the hero power, you're like favored. Because you will not run out of cards and the warrior can just draw poorly and just oh, has to shred oh. That's very interesting. So it's a little bit more mid-rangey, this control warrior. Yeah, so I think like because Trump has the Shredder in his deck, it actually might favor the Handlock slightly more because um, you would have to think to replace the Shredder or to fit the Shredder in, then you have to take out like some of your bigger threats. Like those are what's usually cut for the Shredder. And I think a lot about the matchup is like how big of threats you curve into. Like for example, like Ysera is pretty big, um, and some of these decks, like some of the less greedy versions, they don't have Ysera. Um, but he and Ysera is Acolytes already. So yeah. that's like very huge in this matchup to have like your card uh, draw engine as soon as possible. Yeah. I, think I think people underestimate that in general, actually. I think Ysera is a good example of a, of a key card and how this matchup depends on tech cards because it's not just a big threat and card advantage. It also threatens, it just makes it a lot harder for the handlock player to play safe around Grom, Grom Lethals with Ysera Awakens, Nightmare, and Dream are all extremely threatening and just really... Um, it's a lot harder for the, the Warlock to play safe. He's in a lot of danger at all times if you ever have any Dream card in your hand, any Nightmare card. Uh, yeah, exactly. Wonder. And like sometimes you just have to kind of ignore the Dream card because you can't play around Nisera Awakens or uh, Nightmare. Um, yeah, Nisera Awakens is also like kind of like the auto win card. Like sometimes when you play Nisera in this matchup, it's like I have a one in five chance of winning the matchup immediately. <laughs> That's why it's also so difficult um, to say who's favorite in this matchup. There's like all those small little RNG effects. For example, he plays double Molten Giant and then you toss out an Armorsmith Brawl and your Armorsmith wins. It's like the value you get from that Brawl is just ridiculous, right? And Or you get play a Ragnaros and kill a Giant, for example. Or if a Ragnaros misses, all those situations like affect the game, the outcome of the game so much. So this is kind of funny because both sides are staring at a Belcher and just very inefficient trades into it. And it's like, uh, I'm really good at doing four damage. That thing has five toughness? That's a bummer. Yeah. Defender of Argus, Mortal Quill, all of those would be nice. Especially since uh, Life Coach is known for running two Argus in his decks. 
But uh, here, here's an interesting dynamic, actually. Trump has a Harrison Jones in his hand, but Life Coach is very known for not bringing Jaraxxus in his handlock decks. Like, I don't believe he's used it um, in a list mm. besides, like, demon handlock lists for, like, two or three months. And instead, he just has, like, the Ragnaros as the big threat. So I'm really curious to see if, like, eventually, if this game goes into the late game, how long will Trump hold on to that uh, Harrison Jones? Yeah, he really hates Jaraxxus. Now, Brawl is a key card because it lets you hit that handlock in the face more aggressively. If he plays a bunch of Molten Giants, you don't even care, you just Brawl it, right? Yeah. Not only that, uh, because Control Warriors, they're all attacking against Patron Warriors these days, um, they pretty much all include, like, double Brawl, which I think, like, is really good in this matchup. Just gives you two chances to clear off those Molten Giants. Right. He's valuing the armor smith. So that's 10 cards in hand. Dr. Boom is green. Ooh, and he has seven mana crystals this turn? I like that. Maybe he doesn't see it because it's like on the edge. Yeah. Maybe he doesn't see it. Yeah. It's one of those turns where you sit there, evaluate all the options, and then... He's like going over the cuts, and now he found, he found him. It's like, oh! There's Excellent. Yeah. Excellent play there. You know, you kind of laugh at that, but there was this one time in a tournament where I actually like, like did not see one of the cards in my hand because I was so nervous. Oh man. It can happen. I mean, if you play enough tournament yeah. games, that'll happen to anyone. Yeah, mm. if you have 10 cards in your hand, like, and... You have like oh, oh, like half of them are combo cards, like even free thirds, then you just might miss something. Like my lethal miss against LA and HTC, but we don't want to talk about that. <laughs> Speak to me. So we're getting a lot of value out of this Despite Whirlwind here. Yeah, it's really uh, nice. I was gonna call it. Oh, I yeah. guess that was like kind of close. It had two attack. But I think uh, actually this is really good for Trump because he's able to deal with like one of like the big threats, Dr. Boom, that's a 7-7, seven, seven, without using one of his uh, executes, without using one of his shield slams, or even BGH. So uh -huh. now Trump has even more answers against uh, Life Coach's deck. But he didn't find a shield slam or uh, or a execute yet, yet, right? That's kind of lucky. I feel like the lucky. Control Warrior is pretty favored here. Um, things yeah. are going well for him. He's got the Acera, he's got the Brawl. Nothing really bad has happened. And he still has yeah. so much uh, many removals left. He's drawing cards think, from Acolytes, which is so important for him to win the game. Yeah. I, th I think it's like yeah. the most important. He got double Acolyte in his starting hand, and there was not like giant into giant into Drake into Drake. And there wasn't yeah, Owl. I exactly. Yeah. I think uh, I think like how the hands uh, matched up won. really favored Trump, because Life Coach, he didn't get the big threats, but no Trump, he also didn't get the answers, but instead he got the card draw. So like... Shield? Card draw was exactly what he needed, and he actually didn't need the answers early on. And he probably doesn't run Silence. When you run Shredders, and Isera, and all that stuff, Ragnaros, I don't think he runs an Owl. So that Sylvanas might be annoying. I like that Sun Fury play, making it harder to get to Sylvanas. Yeah. There and you can yeah, see like how experienced of a player life coach is. He really knows that this is like very difficult to get rid of now. Oh, still, these unlucky draws again. Trump, no answers. Ah, uh, that hurts. You really want to save the brawl for at least one Molten. But there's no choice. Well, if Sylvanas survives here... Oh. <laughs> Armor Smith. Kit Kats never lies. Yeah. Kit Kats always right. Go. Yeah, but like you said, like the first brawl is gone, but at least... Um, these days, like Life Coach knows that everyone's running two brawls, so they'll have Wait. to play around the second brawl as well. Wait, Cyf uh, Life Coach doesn't run Siphon so right? And he only one yeah. Owl. So that is Sarah will be huge. Exactly. Yeah, no one's like... Life Coach, I think, is like one of the only players who only runs one Owl. And I think mm -hmm. a part of it is because of his mentality to pretty much never silence your own Watchers. So he realizes that, like... Hey, if I if I'm never silencing my own watchers, then why am I having like two owls in here? But life coach must be right, right? Because many most people would say this is like currently the best handlock player in the world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So ten cards in hand. <laughs> That's so it's so funny. Whenever I see this, it's always like the case with Malilock. 
They have like 10 cards in their hand, it's like one third of your deck and you have no play. Yeah, just the this whole bunch actually, of awkward situational stuff. It, it's pretty common in, uh, in Handlock, like, especially in these like control mirrors. Where like you have like every situational card and like like we said double BGH. In, uh, yeah, uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, yeah. This is the first time we see it. Like all, it's so much BGH. It's a really target from Sandlock. Man, I really want to see like a uh, Mali look or a Sue. Oh, this is a huge play. Sarah comes down. It's really tough to answer here. Is there anything he can do about it? Like if he if he gets desperate, can he clear it? Yes, he can. Uh, Mountain Giant Shadow Flame. Oh, you Dark can see in Life Coach's face. You can see in Life Coach's yeah. face. He's like, really oh, God. Like, he's brutal. considering so many things. Like, Life Coach just, like, maps about everything, right? And this is really something you didn't expect for sure. Oh, this is bad. So, okay, I, I like this play. Basically, he's saying, like, I can't win in the long game. Um, yeah. I pretty much, like, just have to put all my threats out there. I hope he, he doesn't have a he second saw, brawl. And yeah, yeah, yeah. He saw the brawl. Usually don't expect two brawls. I think you do expect two brawls, but he's not in a spot to play around much, right? He's losing, he's gotta take some risks. Play to win. It's difficult, right? When someone plays a shredder, any Sarah, there's really like very, very little room okay. for attacking in control warrior. Yeah, the shredder is a good point. But still, like two brawls very common yeah, yeah. in control warrior these days. Yeah, for sure, for sure. I actually but I don't think I've seen a list without two brawls recently. Okay, that's good. But would like you we're, we're rooting for Trump here, right? So this is good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, as a as a caster, you always want to root for the player who uh, whose turn it is. Yeah. Pretty much. Oh, he 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 knew that he has no removal in his hand and he was like very emotional about that uh, shield Sandra. Wow, that's a lot because, of burst in hand. Because those things execute, cost zero. Execute wouldn't help him because he has like no enabler for him. And we haven't seen Wheelwind yet. He might cut those. So he oh, can kill you, Sarah. It's okay now. But, but there's those two, two dream cards, cards from there. Yeah. yeah, those are those are gonna win the game eventually. Yeah, Nightmare is as strong as Awakens. Like Dream like Plus Nightmare, can... there's no way you're gonna play around the Gromash with those cards forever. It's gonna come. Yeah. Individually, I don't think they're as strong as Awakens, but together they're just they're just like they're putting your opponent on a clock for when Grom happens. It's like a twenty damage Grom out of nowhere, mm. and you can remove a taunt for free. It's like ridiculously strong. So does our giant trade into Sarah and then we shadow flame it, or I uh, we can consider also... shadow flaming the Watcher as well. Right. Oh. Well, hello, Mister Owl. I think. All right, he's going for it. Ouch. Taunts both, doesn't feel very safe. Yeah. I mean, That's yeah. a big top deck. That's huge, yeah. Like two turns in a row for Trump. Right now he's just waiting for Grom, basically. It's like also like when do you play Ragnaros? Like whenever Ragnaros hits face, you know, the brawl is already gone. <laughs> he, he, like a warrior will still lose to Devil Molten Giant. Yeah. Right. So you don't play Ragnaros. You wait for those Molten Giants sometimes. It gives so, plenty of yeah. other options. Even right. Doctor like G can not go in your favor. I I think like how this game has gone down so far uh, is a, can be attributed a lot to the fact that. Trump opened up with double acolyte, and now his hand is so huge. In most games that I see of this matchup, it's like the control warrior is left with like a Ragnaros in his hand and like no other cards, and he's forced to YOLO it. Then the rag goes to face, double molten giants come down, and the control warrior loses the game. But we're seeing this matchup play a lot differently. Yeah, so like you said, it's it's about the draw engine. The warlock has the more consistent draw engine, but in this case, the warrior hit his double acolyte. He got the card draws off of them. He has all the options you need, and so he's probably a pretty big favorite. If he were like one card draw uh, less this game, then he wouldn't have hit that shield slam on time. The execute would be a turn later. Things would be a lot harder. Yeah. I think a lot of people say that maybe Life Coach might be slightly weaker um, because he only plays Handlock. He's very predictable, but he has like done so well in, um, in leagues such as the Kingwin Pro League where he has been predictable. But I think this is one of those games 
where his predictability hurt him a lot because Trump was able to keep cards like double act light in his opening hand. That's a good point. I think Lefkowitz is very happy about the Bolton joint draw because he could like reduce the cost of that as well. It's like it's one of the like it's like the main way to come back into this game. If yeah, there's a way to come back. It looks very some, bad. Something else to consider though is that two Sun Furies have been used, one Defender of Argus has been used, and at least one Sludge Belcher has been used. So um, you would have to think that probably if he plays double BGH, he might not have the second Argus. So there's only like one taunt left in the deck, possibly. This so is what's, Trump, what's yeah. Trump doing about this uh, Emperor? It's pretty awkward, right? <laughs> that sucks. <laughs> there's no way to kill it. What? Well, Yellow rag. I mean, there's, yeah. There's options. That's right. We've got, I mean, we've got a nightmare. We, we have the nightmare. Play rag. Okay. At some point, you have to play it right and YOLO it. Maybe not this point, though. <laughs> YOLO Dr. Boom. Is that even YOLO? Ah, oh, Dream. He's using the Dream. I think that's a good play. That's Yeah, yeah that's good. That's good. It's like kind of setting up people. We were pigeonholing the dream way too much into that uh, it would like remove taunts, but I think uh, like because there's no more taunts left, pretty much, then it's not really that much of a factor anymore. It's it's like the sickest tempo card in the game. It's like a zero mana zap. And lots of really use... tough spot here, right? Because he's used the shadow flame. So like, how do you deal with a giant board like this? Oh yeah, that's yeah. also like a, a new thing that life coach only runs two AOEs nowadays. Like he's mm -hmm. running one hellfire, one shadow flame. Yeah, and I don't think anyone runs double Shadow Flame these days. So it's actually really important that um, Life Coach was pretty much forced to Shadow Flame a Yasera. Or he, he used the Shadow Flame just especially to kill the Yasera. So that Yasera, like, it just swung the game completely. And just oh, a man. good, like, tech choice by Trump. Because he knows that Life Coach, one owl, he runs one owl, he runs only, uh, he doesn't run Cyphered Souls at all. So, like, that Yasera alone is just carrying him throughout the whole way, even though it's been dead for so long. So does this he have to heal bot here to stay safe? Because he really doesn't want to with these molten giants in hand. It doesn't feel like a winning play. And that, that's like the situation where you lose as a handlock to control warrior. Like if you're behind, you, you, you're always dead to Grom, right? You always have to do a play just to like to come back on board and whenever your opponent draws Grom, you're dead. So the Lothab helps defend against potential Nightmare or Ysera Awakens lethal Wait, did you? Double Boombot face for eight is lethal. Yeah. <laughs> it's gonna happen. You don't you just need like wait, you don't even need so You don't much need damage. that much to face, right, with the nightmare he can play. I mean you go for it. You can even wreck yeah. rust, right? Yeah. Go for it. I think we're probably going for it. This is probably oh, a man. Ragnaros turn. So you run yeah. your boombots into the BGH and uh slam Ragnaros. Maybe you play like Armor it. Smith first, because why not? No. It's always cool to see the, um, the zero mana cards costing four mana after Lord Tab. Because they get minus one mana cost from the Emperor. Good. Oh, he's going for it. Boom about RNG, esports. Oh. <laughs> Not enough. Wait, so, so maybe now you just play safe. You just like trade into the BGH and don't attack. That went yeah, well. Like, you saw your opponent had such a weak turn the turn before. Uh, wait, how many... How many taunt givers are gone? Uh, three are gone. So, there's only potentially one more Argus. And wow, double L. Not something we typically see from Life Coach these days, but I guess, uh... He was just, like, a bit unlucky that he didn't draw it for the Ysera. It might still be, like, a mistake, that last attack. Because the only way how the handler can come back is like with the free Moltens. Yeah, you never know. Mate, some good times somebody's gonna show up with double shadow flame, right? Just to get you. Yeah, exactly. Never know. And it, it does feel like one of those games where like if he had the shadow flame right now in his hand, it could just swing around. Not just that, like yeah, you see? Oh. Because he can play the heal bot as well. That tap into just... Argus was it was risky and it paid off. I mean I think it was a good risk to take and it that was really, this is a huge moment in the game. He doesn't even have yeah. so many cards left in his deck. In a way though, I think Trump feels alright about this Argus because if he runs double Argus in his deck as well, then he probably doesn't run Jaraxxus, which is one of the ways he could theoretically come back. And suddenly, it doesn't, now it's like an even game, sort of. 
right? Because he has the answer for the first threat, the Alex Strauss or Ragnar's, whatever he decides to play. Just because of that little attack, he gave like Life Coach a chance to come back into the game. Uh, I think you have to like just use up your nightmare here, use up that resource, and forget about that like twenty damage Grom kill or the uh, seventeen damage Grom. Right, with Molten's out of the way, it's just sort of like a play for board kind of game. It's no, you're no longer as concerned about setting up burst. You've already seen the Molten's. Yeah. Also, Trump, he can kind of like, he, I'm pretty sure he's like tallying down Life Coach's threats right now. And I believe uh, both Mountains were definitely used, both Molten's were used. I'm not sure if the second Twilight Drake was used, but, but so, besides that, um, I think only the only remaining threats are possibly a Ragnaros and possibly a second Twilight Drake. So after that, pretty much uh, Trump has all the freedom in the world. Yeah, but now it might be that Trump threw the game last turn. Like he has the BGH for that, and there's not much left. It depends on how many cast life coach has actually left. Like, what does life coach have left in terms of threats? Uh, just Sylvanas and Twilight Drake. No, he played um, Sylvanas. Yeah. If he'll okay, so then just possibly one Twilight Drake and uh, maybe a Ragnaros. Probably Ragnaros, right? Oh yeah, he's he's uh, afraid of he's Grom. definitely afraid of Grom. But the, is there like a point? Wait, he's because afraid. you're dead to Grom no matter what. Okay, so he's just uh, turn around the board. So Grom would be great. Um, Brawl would be amazing. Oh, and, and, and we see the double owl. <laughs> like we, yeah. we weren't even mentioning it. Life Coach is running two owls. And you know what? This might be. A, this is one of those games where Life Coach breaks his own rule. He silences the owl to go for the attack, or silences the watcher. He will wait till it's lethal. He said only when it's lethal. Okay. The, yeah. The no. When attack. you have two, you just do it right away. Like the game right now is he wants to kill the warrior before Gromash happens, right? Is that correct? What he just did? Mm. Probably. I think it makes but, sense. But there's one heal bot left, right? He played one heal bot. So there's for sure... I mean, he dies faster now. Yeah, I, I'm also wondering how much is Trump uh, figuring fatigue into all this? Because both players, they're really down at a low amount of cards or a low number of cards. Um, and uh, there's like pretty much one of the last threats. Oh man, Trump looks kind of crushed. I mean, he realizes that was like he had the game in his hands, right? He had all the value, everything. He just needed to wait patiently for Grom. Now it looks so bad. It was it was an understandable because like the the, the rope was ticking and the way the boombots went really changed uh, the way he was thinking about the turn because he was looking at lethals and then all of a sudden it's a clear with no lethal and he just has to completely uh, shift his mindset about how to play. So it's yeah. really difficult to do that with the rope burning. Yeah, this is really probably. This is probably the first time we will ever see Life Coach silencing his own watcher. History is made today, guys. It is! This is such a tense game. Like, every top deck matters a lot right now. That's a two-turn battle. Like, like this one? Yeah, yeah, this is... But, wait, oh. he has to life tap for, for Healbot. Like, even if he doesn't top deck it. Yeah, what he the, definitely has. Man, to. if if he, he has no taunts left, if you put this the Wait, last card is, in his deck, is Ragnaros lethal though? Oh, oh, there it is. That's that's but the chance was so likely he gets it right. Yeah, Grimash yeah. is still deaf, right? Yeah, of course. I can't play around it though. How many how many cards does Trump have left? He shouldn't have like too many either. Like five, five. cards left. So twenty percent. So, what what is the last card? Uh, no, I think there's Ragnaros? like two cards. Yeah, Ragnaros or maybe a Belcher. Um, I think, yeah, he has one card left. So I think it's it's one of those. It's either Ragnaros or a Belcher. 20%. He knows 20% I'm dead. Uh, oh, oh my god. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> well, sometimes you get lucky. Wow, life switch. Oh my god. Oh no. No. He's... That game was. Look like at the reactions you... on the players. It was so yeah. bad, it was worth the whole time. That was, that was so incredible. Clutch, right? Yeah, I, all because, the players are going through like an emotional roller coaster throughout that entire game. Yeah, yeah I mean, for, for Life Coach, like he w was behind the entire game, right? And then he ma managed to come back and only die to a, like a Grimash top deck. And Trump being like ahead the whole game. And then kind of... It's not a real misplay, just like the wrong... What do we say? Like line of play. And yeah. then...
comes back to like a top deck and then he gets it. It's crazy. Yeah, the key moment was that turn where the boom bots didn't go face and instead allowed for a clear, and then he attacked for that extra five damage, allowing free molten giants a big swing turn for life coach. It's really a credit to life coach that that game was as close as it was. Yeah, yeah definitely. I think a lot of things went uh, Trump's and, way. And then it must be so much more soul crushing, right? That he loses in the end. Yeah, because he's no, like, no, I, I played well, I deserved it. Yeah. Uh, you don't get what you deserve. You get what you get. Yeah. He's yeah, cool. often not. And you know what? Uh, Life Coach is down even more in the standing. So Zelay, I think you're you're talking about going for like the most wins. The um, the 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 like what what's your record right now, Zelay? Oh, uh, I don't want to talk about that. Let's talk about my okay. team's record, which is two wins and one loss. That's very solid. And uh, so it looks like Nihilum maybe he's going to lose this and be tied with us, or even be behind in overall wins, right? But as Mo yeah. mentioned earlier, they were behind in every series so far, and still managed to uh, pull out the win. Yeah, they're not against Archon, right? They were uh, ahead against Archon, but then they pulled it out. And then RDU couldn't get the last win. I think that's how it worked out. But they were like way behind against Liquid, and they pulled it out in the end. And I think that's um, because they had this experience of pulling it out in the end one time, then I think like together as a team, they'll trust each other more, and they'll realize, like, hey, we can do this no matter what. I think probably just about every team has that level of like professionalism going for them. Like these are all top tier tournament players. Everybody here's uh, had comeback stories. You you have to to make it this far in Hearthstone. You have to be able to lose some games and still stay tough and and pull it out. Yeah. One other thing to note is that RDU has always been the last player to uh, get the win out. So again, we haven't he seen RDU actually play today. Yeah, he always met. He he's like the clutch, clutch player of Nellum. In the end, um, he will get that last win. But so far, we haven't seen him even come out yet, even though and, he's... And he's also, also, like, what is nobody mentioning, Thais has probably, like, the best win ratio with Druid, right? In the in the Archon League. Like, everyone has used, so, like, a lot of lo losses when he brings so, Druid, except Thais. So basically what you're saying is that Thais is the only player that has a positive win rate with Druid. Yeah. What a god. He is known yeah. for being, like, a really good Druid player, right? But he is, yeah. He's... Very, very good Druid player. Like, he's always brought Druid from, from the beginning beginning of Hearthstone, and he was doing always really well with it. It's yeah. kind of nice to see. So, Tysa, he's mostly known, like, in the beginning, he was mostly known for uh, winning the I Heart Thieu King of the Hill 10 times in a row. And a funny stat about that is that, like, he actually had a negative record with other every other deck besides Druid. But with <laughs> Druid, he had something like like a 20 and 3 record. <laughs> That's absurd. Yeah. <laughs> Man, carrying all the way. Yeah, and he was like, uh, like he was like one of the forefathers of Wild Growth Druid. Like back in the day, before Tice came along, like Wild Growth actually wasn't that great of a card because every deck, every other deck was uh, Zoo pretty much, and like Wild yeah. Growth wasn't the best against Zoo. But then Tice brought it out along the Wild Growth Druid, and he just like began dominating everyone. Wild Growth was probably always to take a good turn. Card. People just maybe didn't know it. Like I feel like. I wasn't really playing much Hearthstone at the time. I was busy with Magic. I feel like I would have seen that card and said, that one's good. Yeah, I played Ramp like very, very early and it was very strong. Yeah. Gara is also, yeah, we want to mention that Gara was like pretty much like the first player to win a tournament with Ramp Druid. Uh, not like, and, and not even just like normal Druid, but no combo Druid. And it was like one of, of the few decks that could play around Buzzard and Leash because that was like so broken. You could just play like one big taunt or like two big taunts and just play with that. And yeah, Buzz and Unleash is not good against that. So this is a big moment. What's the Warlock? Oh, it's Handlock. That's, uh, that's bad news. It's v like every, like obviously the strategy was targeting the Handlock of Trump. So you can't lose against it, right? Imagine like if Adio loses this match, that's not just a normal loss. It's like a loss against the deck, the tech, all the decks against. Yeah, exactly. And um, this is going to be mid-range Hunter, which is interesting because every week, I believe RDU has brought the hybrid Hunter. So I'm a little curious as to like why he changed it up, especially for just this match alone. And because I think like the hybrid Hunter versus mid-range Hunter, they're like it's very similar against Handlock. Oh, well, Hunter's Mark is a big pickup in this matchup. Also, I want to say the Hunter had an interesting turn one. Like there's a lot of merit to coin Juggler to put on maximum pressure. Um, he had a solid follow-up with Haunted Creeper. Turn 1 Web Spinner gives away a little bit of information about what he's doing. He could maybe conceal that for a few turns. 
but there's there's merit to doing it this way as well, right? Like coin yeah. gives you a lot of flexibility. Maybe you get a turn. And it five plays around dark bomb, because yeah, like in his turn two he would just dark bomb, but in turn three he's like less likely to dark bomb. Yeah, okay. exactly. And it also like somewhat plays around mortal coil, in the sense that your opponent probably doesn't want a mortal coil on turn three or on oh. turn two rather. Oh, that's also big. That was a big yellow. And that's oh also my big. god. <laughs> The RNG is with him. Yeah, and I mean, was, this matchup was crazy. This, this yeah. matchup is typically very favored against uh, in the favor of mid range hunter, and this is actually one of the like the most favored matchups in the entire game. Uh, the stats are twenty two to seven with a seventy six percent win rate. And look at this, just everything perfect for the hunter. Yeah. Owl. Oh, oh, oh my god. Oh man, this, this can't get disgusting. any better. This is brutal. Like, yeah, because he has like tempo high man with Hunter's Mark, it doesn't matter. There's like no way Hunter can come back into this one. Yeah, sorry, Trump. You're... This is not happening for you. Yeah, the, the problem this is. This is also big. <laughs> yeah. Wow. The, the problem with uh, this matchup is that every turn, the Hunter, if they curve out correctly, they can develop such huge threats. And the, the handlock, like, they can't deal with all those threats most of the time. And also, it's the fact that the hunter has a lot of like burst damage from their hand, so they can easily burst around multiple. No, 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 no. This is an interesting turn. That was a misplay. You hunter mark first. You hunter mark and then coin out there. Do you think now you if you hunter mark? No, you hunter mark it and then coin out the high main. Okay. And then and you assuming you it. missed the juggle. Yeah. Then what's the play? You trade the hunter creeper yeah, the in and the owl. You you don't need a hunter's mark. Like he can't play a giant. If he plays a giant, he's dead. Y you have to hunter's mark this large belch. I don't know what he saves the hunter's mark for. I wonder. Yeah, like now Maybe he could do some hellfire shenanigans, or like now he could owl hellfire, and only like two one ones would survive. You can't. You need to protect the hymen. That's why you set like use everything. Uh, uh, like in turn five, you play like freezing trap and use bow and hunter's mark just to get uh, like this strongest possible hymen turn. And now this is like not the optimal hymen turn turn because you let the sludge belcher live. There's now there's ways to remove it. If you if you kill the sludge belcher, there's just no way to kill hymen. What do you think about trading into that juggler? Because the hymen is going to eat your belcher anyways, and you can instead develop owl silencing the hymen. Like instead of dark bombing the juggler, you yeah. just trade it into your belcher because it's yeah, gonna uh, die on board anyways uh, to high main, and then you can yeah. owl the high main. Yeah, that's yeah, that's probably a better play. The problem is like you're like there's a lot of things in the um, in the mid range hunter deck that does like two to three damage, I guess. So he might be afraid of like this eagle horn bow, for example. Okay. And because of that, like the high main like might have the opportunity to go for face for six. And, and usually, like if he had the hunter's mark, he would have used it last turn. Kappa. <laughs> It's yeah, like very common. Bow, if he bows down the front half of the belt here, his high main's still running into the slime though, right? He needs just, like multiple things to get through. Just just look how different this turn would have been. Like he would have pushed all the damage through with the high main and everything, and he could set up Lord Tap. And you can't like you can't molten giant shadow flame and stuff. It doesn't matter. So Yeah. I, I think yeah, I uh, the hunter is just like still way ahead here. Yeah, yeah this is crazy. Like to to win, the, a lot of things have to happen. Whoa, that's correct. Could have Argus been killed off the hind. Yeah, I was expecting an Argus there. Yeah, because now it's like, like you can def like the the hunter will be able to like, get in six damage in. Yeah, uh, not not just eleven even. Yeah, eleven's but, a big like, number. Yeah, if you Argus, you would remove Wait, six lethal? damage from the board, right? He can quick shot, uh, quick shot we your just, power. Are we gonna push for damage? Mm. Not care about moltens, or this is an interesting decision point in the game. But yeah, but then you have to use the bow and not the eleven. I don't like it. You, you wait. I think you don't put him all the way down. I think you. Yeah, that's okay. that's not good. Yeah, yeah, it's because it's, it's mana inefficient and you don't have kill command in your hand as well. And you don't have... Yeah, he still has Hunter's Mark, so it's fine, I guess. He's yeah. putting him to... Oh, he's not even putting him to six, he's putting him to seven. Because he would like to put him to five where he can quick shot hero power through a taunt, right? Yeah. I guess he figures it's okay to risk Moltens because he has the Hunter's Mark in hand. Exactly. But usually but he... ten life is the worst possible life to put him on. Right, he probably could have just skipped an attack. Oh my god. Oh, big pickup. Oh, well. 
we've seen a lot of this today, just these huge double molten giant turns with like you don't have to put the hand lock down to ten, but we do, and then but it's still double enough moltens for the punish. His dark pump double molten. Uh, he has one hunter's mark. That's the problem, and he can break through the. Well, maybe it's wow. This might actually be enough because if he has to use the lot tip to to kill the other giant, he has he's like out of steam, and he has hellfire hellfire healbot next turn. Oh don't wow! Me. Oh my god, the top decks are real. <laughs> Look at that RD. This is a silly day. Yeah. This is crazy. So this is just I don't know. It's just so lethal, right? I haven't counted. That looks like a lot. This uh, lineup is definitely very anti lock as we can see. Double Hunter's double. Mark. Gar, I, th yeah. I think you ran double Hunter's Mark last week, right? Uh, was it last week? No. Yeah, Hunter? Uh, no, I played Chucky's deck and it doesn't have Hunter's uh, okay. Mark. I think Chucky is, has like the strongest Hunter deck right now. His version of a good Hunter. Yeah, we Shout out to Chucky. Chucky, you're the boss. This yeah. been Chucky has been a series so far. I'm really enjoying the games. Yeah, especially like uh, the strategy that's like we haven't seen the strategy much in the conquest format, or at least in the um, the Archon League format, because typically like you can target a single deck in the conquest format, but it's a little different here because number one, you're guaranteed, or your opponents are guaranteed to bring that deck almost. Like they're, they're, your opponents are much more predictable in the lineups they bring. But second of all, like you pretty much have to bring six counter decks, which is quite hard. Right. Yeah, it, it's 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 interesting that we haven't seen too many super like targeted lineups because of like you said you're you're kind of forced to bring a lot of the same things every week. Um, but it's it's in Hearthstone it's just so hard to consistently beat one deck. Like sometimes they just draw well and you don't. Even if you have the right tech cards, you, you're going to lose some games. Yeah, and, like, like you, even you think, it, even in just normal yeah. conquest, it's such a high risk. What if he doesn't bring the decks? But like. If you target a deck with six decks or five decks and he doesn't bring the deck, that's like it's <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um like you, you also have to think like Druid, if even if you bring W B G H, it's not like near a hundred percent win rate. I would give it like sixty, seventy at like if I we're really pushing it. So like it's actually like quite easy for Trump to actually sneak a win in, but just like judging by like the strategy that Nilum brought, even though they're behind now. I think like they actually have a pretty decent chance. I don't know, remember if you saw the Y Games hand, uh, anti handlock deck from Thais. Oh yeah, oh yeah. With, with the Giants, and it's still almost lost. Like a uh, double Owl, double Earthshock, double BGH, double Hex, and the uh, Clockwork Giants. Like absolute anti handlock. <laughs> it's still almost lost. Yeah, it's it was pretty much uh, Thais. He had like something like a 10% chance of losing because he had like two crackles in his hand at the end and he had to like make sure the crackles didn't do like three to four damage each. They had to go for five or six. So that was pretty interesting. Like 100% hand handlock counter still like had a chance to lose against handlock. Yep. It's just really yeah. tough to hard counter anything in Hearthstone. Yeah. The best it example is, is Patron. Game. Like even the best Patron counter decks lose like 50% of the times to Patron. Yeah, I, I think I had a game in this league. No, maybe it wasn't. But uh, I had a game, a tournament game, where like both of my death spites got oozed, and I just won anyways. <laughs> Crazy. <laughs> yeah. uh, I've seen that happen quite a lot. Like, you see ooze in Harrison Jones in pretty much like almost every deck these days, and like the Patron Warriors like still sneak out games sometimes. Yeah. So, so what are we expecting to see here out of this? I mean it could be it's it could be anything, right? Warrior versus Warlock. So okay, so I think this is probably the best matchup that Trunk could hope for. If this warrior is gonna be like a patron warrior, which we almost can expect it to be. Um but like again, like did Life Coach bring BGHs and like shield slams or like brawls in his uh patron warrior deck just to counter the warlock? That's a real Life question. Coach has been playing a lot of, a lot of Patron Warrior on stream lately. So oh, it, would yeah. be, it would be really funny if he just showed up with Control Warrior, just ju juked everybody like, oh yeah, that stream practice? No, no, no. But 40 hours believe, into that just to trick you. I don't think I've ever seen him... Okay, I think I've seen him play Control Warrior once in his first ever tournament, which was 
um, the EU versus China number one tournament, and this was like one and a half years ago. Um, but besides that, like I've seen him play Mech Warrior, and I've seen him play lots of Patron Warrior, but never Control Warrior. That's really interesting. You'd think Life Coach would love the Control Warrior style since he's so into Handlock. Those are kind of a similar feel of deck. He really likes thinking things through, having lots of options, right? Yeah. But Not only that, he's he's a big fan of the Control Paladin as well. So those like kind of fit in a similar like. They're pretty similar as well, right? For me, the most surprising thing is about Life Coach that everyone would like uh, um, agree that Hunter is very strong, right? Most of the time. Like, it never gets, like, super weak. And Life Coach was one of the first Hunter players. Like, his Sunshine Hunter was, like, super popular, right? He was, like, one of the best Hunter players in the world. And that he really doesn't play Hunter at all nowadays. This is, like, very mm. interesting to me. So this yeah. is going very well for Trump, the mulligan part of the game. He has double mountain giant, just huge threats. He's going to put Life Coach to the test. He has to find those executes fast. Yeah. And if, like, again, like we said, this is probably, like... I would say this is like the deciding match of the entire, uh, or at least the most important match of the entire series. Because if oh, yeah, Trump so is able to sneak a win here, like like his handlock is free, and all these like BGHs in all the Nolim's other decks, they're pretty much useless, or mostly useless. So like, what do you think about the, this matchup? Like, what, what are the percentages? Because everyone says like handlock is such a big counter. Right, well, I... it's going to depend on the tech cards and all that, so I don't want to put percentages on it, but certainly Handlock is a favorite. I would say they're like less than 70%, maybe 60-something. Um, it depends a lot on, on tech cards on both sides. Like Theoretically, you could put like a Brawl in the Patron Warrior, and that's going to help you a lot. Um, how many weapon destruction cards are in the Handlock deck? I would guess typically one, sometimes zero, rarely two. There's a, there's a lot of factors that go into it. I thought the Patreon Warrior's mulligan was pretty interesting. He kept the frothing and the Emperor. I guess Emperor makes a lot of sense when you know you're queuing into Handlock. It's not ladder where it might be Zoo. Uh, frothing is a, a risky card to keep because if you don't have an Execute to protect it, you can't really just run it out there. So you're, what, just keeping a combo card in your opening hand? That's kind of interesting. Yeah. Look, there's um, Execute. I, That's big. Yeah. I think a, maybe a part of it is that, like, Frothing is basically your win condition in this matchup. So, like, if you if it's like in the bottom like twenty cards or like five cards of your deck, like you pretty much can't win this matchup at all. So I disagree. Probably... Like you you can draw your whole deck. I think uh, I think you really want to have answers to their big threats in the early game and a lot of card draw to get through things. You want to be just developing and killing their threats and drawing cards. You don't. I don't think you want to keep anything like Warsong Commander. So if, to keep Frothing is sort of like keeping Warsong Commander, except that. Frothing's a much better, just like you can actually play it on turn three because it's hard to deal four damage. Chainlock's good at dealing three with Dark Bomb and Hellfire, but it's a lot harder to have Dark Bomb plus Coil. Well, Trump's excited about right. something. Right. Did he see that? Yeah, he's yeah. just doing that. That is, that is way too exciting. Oh, he, he, I think he's saying like <laughs> turn two rope. How is he roping? Uh, like, yeah, if yeah, I can yeah, read well, his mouth movements, like, why is he roping on turn two? He's what, like, has he never played Life Coach before? <laughs> This is I've never seen Trump so excited. Or yeah, like so this emotional. Is like, this is a very standard life coach here. <laughs> but that's like a really good hand from, from, from Trump, right? He got three of, uh, out of the four big threats. Yeah, does Trump lead with uh, Twilight Drake to like be a little bit, like kind of lead with the weak one to see if it gets executed? And it also leads into like a tap giant turn? Or does he figure, you know, I have double giant, just go hard? Trump is out of here. Yeah, Trump is Trump is not gonna lead. He's gonna leave. <laughs> he's, he's like, I'm gonna yeah. get a drink now. <laughs> I can use the bathroom. I'll be here. I'll be back in like two minutes. I really I'm like frothing like here turn. for the patron warrior. I like frothing because he has the execute. So if you show up with uh, Drake or Giant or whatever, you can just kill it. And it's tough to deal with that frothing. I think the reason you kept oh. it is so you can play it in spots like this. I see. Oh, interesting. What? I think that's, that's a very really interesting play. I think most players, they definitely wouldn't do that. Um, like, just from what I've seen on stream and what I've seen in tournaments. But um, I definitely want to see, like, if Life Coach considers that and if, uh, yeah, he just goes for the armor pass. I think yeah, holding it in game. hand is like, uh, I don't know why you'd keep it off the mold <laughs> if you're not going to play it there. <laughs> oh, he kept it as well. But there's a lot of room to play Patron in different ways and be effective. That was a big tap. Hot, hot deck. Now he has a lot of setup for lethals with Emperor, Warsong, Frothy, Unstable Ghoul, and Death Spite. Mm -hmm. So this turn he's probably got to deal with that giant, probably like face tank 8, execute it, and then what? 
maybe play a death spite, setting up to coin emperor. I don't know if he wants to coin emperor though, because he's not actually in a huge rush to get out emperor. You kind of want to play it on the last turn before you kill them. When the patron plays emperor, it's a lot of times it's a tell that they're looking to kill you. Because the later you play it, the more time you have to get a discount on something like Whirlwind. Yeah. Zlay, you're, you're very lively when you talk about these uh, Patron Warrior matchups. It's oh yeah, uh, there's a lot going on. There's a lot to think about. Patron's one of the most complicated decks, and uh, you can make a lot of mistakes and still win. There are a lot of ways to play it. It's really interesting. Yeah. That's why I enjoy watching your stream when I want to learn about Patron plays. Well, thanks. All, like all about your, your smooth and hairy Patrons, right? Oh yeah. Right to the Life face. Life Coach is giving the, the viewers enough time to place your bets on what's, what's his play here. I was not going to bet on that play ever. This is That's interesting. Really Life Coach is just playing completely different for me, but he's also a good patron player, right? He also wins a lot. Yeah, but exactly. he, he's really analyzing every situation, like every complicated situ situation he had. Like in Trump's in really game. playing those 8-8s. Eight That's good. That Lothab is actually a really big pickup. Uh, it's probably going to win in the game. I'd say he has a ton of pressure, and it's gonna it's gonna throw things off. He's really not thinking so much about like life. Life coach hit his face like twice in a row with his Warrex, and he just like snap plays those joints. Yeah, Should this be... is what life coach is going for with those last. Right, that's why he went face. He wanted to set up this lethal, and this Lothab is um. Does it stop the lethal? Because actually, a lot of those those are all minions. He doesn't need whirlwinds and enrage for this lethal. Yeah, you. He needs like, uh, like a defender of Argus definitely has to come down here. Has it though? So, is this a spot where you can leave the emperor up because the game's gonna end, so the second emperor discount doesn't matter? That's a good point. But you're leaving one more minion on the board, and you're also uh, you're leaving like the five five on the board as well. So it's like so potential for more damage. To your face, um, if you don't clear it, you also have to consider that. Um... Yeah, I okay. like this. I like setting up lethal for next turn. I don't know about the ancient watcher. How does that help? Yeah, you? yeah, that doesn't do anything. That's He's that's one more minion. The thing about clearing the emperor is the emperor is dealing five damage to a giant either way, right? Like, I don't yeah. Know. yeah, yeah. So you're just kind of missing nine face yeah, the... damage if you trade into it. Yeah, the watcher so... really doesn't do anything. He's like hoping for an owl top deck, I guess, just to fit in that extra four damage. Is that it? Probably. <laughs> you know I can't. You just do it. <laughs> There's no way I'm counting this right now. Yeah. I don't have to. I'm not doing it. Um. Yeah. He it has to be it. Yeah. It it's it's lethal. I think if it's you up. swing with Death Spite first, it whirlwinds the unstable goal. So that's like one less damage this way, right? Very impressive play by Life Coach, like from turn one. That yeah, was like is, exactly his plan. This is like pretty like if you ever want to show someone in a video of like why life coach ropes all the time um, and like like what he's considering, this is exactly it because like he roped like pretty much every single turn from turn one to turn four, but on there's, turn five he just like instantly coined out the emperor. Which there's like, something really that, important like, here. He just went down yeah. to two life, which means if instead of playing that watcher, Trump just realized if he had dark bomb face instead of playing that watcher. Then yeah. swinging the death spite into a nine attack minion would have just been suicide, and this line of play would not have been possible. So playing yep. that watcher not only added more damage to the Frothing Berserker, which turned out to be relevant, but it also it missed a huge opportunity to dark bomb face and deny the uh, death spite swing. Yes. Yep. Wow. So that was actually like a really complicated game, especially since like we were saying that this is the most important game in the series, where like ha uh, Trump's handlock. This was like the best chance for that handlock to get a win. So it's like. It's all going to be on that handlock right now. Can he ever going to get a win against like the the, the two BGHs and probably every single remaining deck from Nilum? That's like a really easy mistake to make. Like like almost nobody thinks about that. But sometimes you just want to put that patron warrior low enough so that he can't swing his weapon for the lethal the next turn. Actually, You're because you brought that, that up, Life Coach is one of those players who really values the phase damage a lot with his giants when he plays handlock. Just because of that situation, also especially against Hunter, when they have like a ball out, they usually need like the to hit the giant to clear it. And if you hit them face, that's like already 16 damage if they have to hit it, right? Even if they have like a minion out, he always like values to hit face or clearing. And that was like really a nice situation right there instead of using oh. the dark bomb. I like this benched graphic. That's pretty cool. I know this is pretty new and pretty awesome. Like we know that Trump now he can't play. So now Nolium will 
like they'll pretty much they'll bring their worst deck. I feel against yeah, but, Warlock out, uh, right? We will see a Druid for. Mm. Shouldn't be too quick on the Druid pick. Is that a Druid turn? Hmm. So the Warlock is benched. So it's Hunter or Druid coming out, and what do you want to play while the Warlock is benched? Yeah. So yeah, I think there's like two things to consider, and the first I think is the most important. What do you want to play uh, now that the Warlock is benched? What's the best against Warlock? And the se second thing to consider is uh, what's uh what do you want to play against a potential Hunter or Druid? But again, I don't think that's as important because Nilium's entire strategy is based off of killing that Handlock over and over again. Yeah. The the thing is like the uh, Handlock would be the best to pick for Nihilum, just because it would be a mirror match, right? And the other two decks are tech to beat Handlock. It's probably Mech, Shaman, and Druid with double BGH. Yeah. But then well, you would I... pick into, like, into Hunter or Druid. Mm -hmm. We did see, though, that the Life Coach's Handlock had double BGH. So I guess that deck is slightly teched against Trump's uh, Handlock as well. And Handlock is widely considered, like, one of the skill matchups. So I think uh, Life Coach is, like, confident that as, like, the best Handlock player, um, mm -hmm. Or as like what most people would consider like one of the best handlock players, I think he would consider himself having an advantage over Trump, especially with a double BGH. For, for both teams, it looks um, like it will be difficult to get a win on this handlock because all three decks seem to be yep really strong against it. Yeah, it might come down to the handlock mirror. Whoever wins it will win this series. Yeah, you, you say that uh, Handlock versus Druid is like, I think most people will consider that Druid favored, but in reality, I think it's like much more even. Um, and I think that's a large part due to because some of like the swing turns are just like, they feel so bad, like getting BGH on, on turn four feels so bad, getting but, keepered and... Uh, but if you know, if you know as the Druid player that it is Handlock, it also gives you like a big advantage. I yeah, think. that's a good point as well. So Shaman yeah, versus you, Hunter, I feel like the Hunter's favorite here. What do you guys think? Um, yeah, I think I would sure. agree with that. I think uh, yeah. just like sh Hunter overall is generally considered a better deck. Um, and I also feel like if there's like Hunter's marks in this deck, for example, against a Fell Reaver, that could just like be a huge Ooh. swing. Yeah. Um, I also think that the Hunter is like slightly more consistent in their draws because the, the Shaman, it has like, it curves up very high, first of all. And it also has like a lot of situational burn, like crackles, um, the uh, the lava bursts. Like you don't want to draw them early on, or even like doom hammers. Part of the reason Hunter is so consistent is its hero power is actually useful. So when your cards aren't that great, your, your hero power really does something. Whereas shaman, when your cards aren't great that turn, you're like, uh, I guess I get this totem thing. Yeah, and we're seeing like I think one of the most important cards in this matchup is the glaive zuka. And I think like it's a card that's like really good against other like aggro decks, uh, but like not so great against control decks because this because of this exact situation where the Glaive Zuka can like two or three for one basically. So Mechwarper or Zapomatic? Mm. <laughs> Usually this is the the funny thing is that um, Hunter has so many turn two plays. Yeah. The worst one is Glaive Zuka, and you always hope they don't have a Glaive, Glaive Zuka. You always yeah, that, like, like Zapomatic is really punished by Glaive Zuka, but you're you're in trouble either way if he has Glaive Zuka. So I'm thinking yeah. about other things more. If you play the Zapomatic right now, um, it can get some hits in before something like Bo comes down to stop it. He goes for the Mech Warper. That's going to work out well for him, right? Like even even the Flame Tank Totem wouldn't be too terrible because on turn two it's difficult to kill it, and the next turn he could play the. So? Mech yeah. Warper plus Zapomatic. Is there any merit to not going for Glaive Zuka here? Maybe he's so afraid of the Mech Warper that you actually quick shot it? To shoot. Mm. Mm. That's really hard to do. Wow. Quick shot is fine. Now you uh, can hit like with the Hunter Creeper into the 1 2. I think that was fine. Yeah. I don't, I don't think it's a bad play. I'm just surprised. It's like it's like an interesting play, right? Mm -hmm. I, I would have done the same probably. I think it's fine. Maybe it's uh, Kibler considers this like such a strong matchup for him that he just like wants to go with the safer play overall. It's like like for the Mech Shaman to come back on board is 
nearly impossible. You don't run lightning storm. You usually don't even run earth shocks. Like in his version, he probably runs at least one earth shock. But even the one ones are like such a big threat. You could like bow here for mana efficiency. What do you think about that? I think mm -hmm. if you glaive Zuka, you probably want mm -hmm. to uh, kill off the Cogmaster first, and then get the buff on one of the remaining spiders. Uh, yeah, I like I like the the bow here actually. Yeah, I like the bow as well uh, for mana efficiency because I think that's yeah. really important in Hunter first of all, but also because the Glaive Zuka buff is actually pretty important later <laughs> later down in the road, um, that you can like use it save it for later on basically. Or next turn, you could use the bow next turn and just buff a minion with the Glaive Zuka, play a uh, two drop because it's very high yeah. you will draw one, or just hero power on every hero power is important as well. Noitron's a great card against Hunter, but will it be enough here? Probably not in this situation, unfortunately. No. Honestly, this game is uh, looks already over. Yeah, yeah I'd I have to agree here. Like, there's just no way that the uh, the shaman can get back board control. Shaman's like, it, it has like the power mace, which usually helps uh, getting back board control and against some other classes. But against like the hunter that just has a lot of minions that have one HP, it's probably not very good. Shredder's a beautiful pickup for this turn too. It's um, it's funny. The hunter is behind on life by nine, right? But the early game is just not about life totals. Yeah. The early game is all about board control, and the hunter has all of it, and that's what matters. And hunter can way easier transition into phase damage than like the other aggro decks, just because of the hero power. As soon as a hunter has like board control, it's like instant switch, and he just kills you in two turns. Yeah, but it's much diffi more difficult for the other classes. All right, so what are we looking for here, Doomsayer? Explosive sheep. Explosive sheep is, is a nice one. Oh, that's that's kind of oh, but yes, yes, the Glazuka. All right, Leok might activate this egg at some point. Oh. Yeah, not only. Is, yeah, exactly. Leok, Glazuka. That's oh, actually so huge. Good. That Glazuka. It's like a completely dead minion usually on board. This and then probably animal companion. Yeah, sounds good. You don't really yeah, need to. Most of the animal companions survive the power mace, which is important here. Yeah. It, something interesting to note is that as Kibler is getting further and further ahead in this game, his camera is getting lighter while RDU is like growing more more dark. <laughs> it is the Leah. Uh, yeah, so he, he gets the double buff. It, it also gives like more hounds. Yeah, he's pl he's playing super safe. He's playing around like playing twenty totem everything. Whoa, an that's interesting an interesting one. Here. Yeah, typically not. Uh... You know what it is? It's uh, the handlock tech. He's being like super anti handlock. Okay. So he's even bringing hex instead. So there's some consistency within their lineup regarding tech choices. I like it. That's a high main. Only cost him four mana. It's a pretty good card. Ooh, oh. this owl. <laughs> Why? It's so clutch. Killer's reactions are so great too. He's like, yeah, I top deck that. That's pretty good. And not only that, he'll be able to pop the egg, yeah. kill off the pilot shredder, and there's just no hope here. This is brutal. It's it's also funny because the uh, the hunter is actually losing in terms of life total. Yeah, still. but like these but kind of matchups, are, they're all about board control. Uh, you might actually play the, the Shaman I played last week, just from the looks of it. Oh yeah, I've been meaning to ask about that. It was such a weird Shaman list, because it had it was like kind of Mech Shaman, but it had so many low drops, and it also yeah. had like uh, like Feral Spirits, Lightning it's, Bolt, for example. Yeah, it's much faster than the... It's just a more consistent deck. It's, just, it's basically the best Shaman list right now. I, I don't even know who came up with it. It's like some, some NA guy. So if you're the, the hunter here, are you thinking about Lightning Storm as like the only way you lose this game? And do you keep I clearing these totems at this life total? I don't think he plays you... around Flame Tongue. I mean, like, he went with this line of play the whole time, so you kind of have to stay consistent. It's kind of weird yeah. that he kills two totems and now he starts ignoring them, right? Yeah, well, I also think uh, I think it's because uh, the um, the frog is like kind of blocking any possible totem damage. Honestly, the main reason why I would kill totems is just because it reduces the chance of them rolling a taunt totem. Taunt totem is like the only annoying one. Yeah. 
I hear the phrase stay consistent a lot, but uh, I don't always agree with it because, I mean, things change over the course of a game. Just because yeah. initially it was right to do things one way, it doesn't mean there doesn't come a point where yeah. it switches over and you go for face. I think that's a really good point Monk made about the, the taunt eating up a potential flame tongue hit. So maybe the totem's just irrelevant. Oh, uh, this yeah. feels really bad. When you have to lava burst at 3 1. Uh, th that's like no way. Like, he gave up like his own last win condition, right? Some sort of. Crackle into lava burst into something else. That's now he's, it. yeah, it's just. A, um, yeah, Kibla undefeated. Wow. Yeah, so uh, eight zero score and like, by far the best record in Archon Team League so far. Pretty sure we'll get a pretty cool. Um, we we'll get a pretty cool article for him saying how he went AO and uh, <laughs> how he's like pretty much the best player in the world right now. I yeah. would say easily. Easily. Yeah, but you, you know, it's a lot of it is about like just bringing the same decks over and over again. Uh, he actually brought Druid one time, but he brought a uh, Mech, Mech Shaman and Hunter pretty much every single time. He's obviously like he's played very well with those decks, especially as we saw in the first game against the Handlock, where he could have just like lost the game if he played Fell Reaver. So all credits to him for uh, being in the lead in terms of like having uh, the title of Master of Duels. How much money do you get for that Master of Duels? 5k. Five 5k, five yeah. But, you know, it's not only that you have to have the best record, but you also have to make the playoffs. Ooh. So I think, uh, I think Value Town is doing, like, pretty well now. They're 2-1, and they're in a lead for the uh, next series, or for that the current series. That has to be, like, the most frustrating thing that could happen in Archon League. You get the Master of Duels, but your team doesn't qualify for the playoffs, so you don't get the 5k. Yeah, that's brutal. Feels bad, man. I think... I think for a Kibler, maybe the uh, the title is even more valuable than the money itself because he's already like he's got a name and a reputation in Magic: The Gathering already, so it's really nice to like pretty much have a have but like do a you title, get the title for every single game. But if your team doesn't course, qualify, someone else gets the like. Oh, okay. No, no, you don't get it if you don't get it, right? Yeah, you don't get it if you don't yeah. get it. All right, stay stay up with the times. <laughs> Just wouldn't make sense. <laughs> Wait. All right, so. Then nobody would get the five K, right? No, you give it to no, whoever whoever actually qualifies whoever's team actually qualifies that has the highest record should get the title and the money, right? Exactly. exactly. Should be that way. We'll okay, see. What it happens. is that way. It is that way. I'm pretty sure it's that way. We can get a clarification later, but let's move on to the the next potential series. Um, because Kibler won the last match, Trump is no longer benched. So again, we're gonna see kind of a mind game. Do they bring Dog or do they bring Trump? And just like looking at these lineups, I have to say, I think the two remaining decks for Value Town are their weakest decks. You yeah, normally is... wouldn't think of as like Hadlock being a weak deck, but Nilium, they're like countering that deck. And also, like Druid is just like one of the weaker decks. So yeah, I think it's is... going to be an uphill battle. This is still anybody's game, right? That both, yeah, it's not just an uphill battle. Like both players have the, pretty much the same decks, just that uh, Nikolim so... has one more deck. When you're Value Town here and you're deciding what to queue up, do you flip a coin just to make yourself uh, as unpredictable as possible? Hmm. I, th I think I, I personally, if I were in charge of anything, I would probably flip a coin. There's like not really too much think. Like, like suggest to me like an alternative plan, for example. Well, you could flip a coin to decide whether or not to flip a coin. And then the other <laughs> half of the time you try and decide based on other factors. That would be fun to do. Can you really go for a strategy at this point? It's like when both of your decks are unfavored against basically everything. Like the Druid Mirror match would be the best possible pairing for Value Town right now, I guess. Yeah, you would think it's... that the the Druid actually would the Druid Mirror would actually favor Dog because he's probably not running two BGHs in his deck. Okay. Right? Yeah, it's, but that's like, oh man, what kind of edge does it give you? Yeah, yes, exactly. I feel like that. <laughs> I think uh, Dog wants to run his Druid into RDU's Shaman, maybe? Really? I, I actually, in terms of stats, that's actually the most one-sided matchup in the game. Mech Shaman is 14-2 and two against Druid in okay. tournament play. Yeah, no, I guess it wouldn't make sense. Let's see. Uh, this is really tough. It's really yeah, tough. I would flip a coin. I like the coin flip. I mean, you could also go to a website and have it pick a random number. That's another way to do it. Lots yeah, of ways you to decide think, which deck to go with. 
Okay, so you're going with like the pseudo random thing in terms of a website instead of like an actual real life random scenario. No, no, no. And the website's actually random. It says so. They would never lie to you on the internet. Okay, fair enough, fair enough. The other thing is like to consider if you actually flip a coin, like Trump, Kibler, and Dog, they're not in the same place. So like, th I think the website might even be more reliable. Maybe like yeah. if Trump flips the coin, he could just be like, uh, yep. like, reverse the results, right? You don't even have to flip a coin. It's basically you expect Shaman. It's very likely they will go for the Shaman because it's favored against both decks. And then you like, with which deck you're more fa uh, favorable or like more comfortable to go against the Mech Shaman with the Reuter Handlock. It's tough, right? It's so close. What would you rather play against Shaman, Mech Shaman, Druid or you know what? You know what? I actually think um, there is might be some strategy because, again, it's not only the match winner that matters, but also who, um, whoever gets the best game differential. So it might make some sense to just send out the deck that you think has a better chance of winning against the rest of uh, Nilium's lineup. Does that make sense? Yeah. Gary seems very confused. No, it, it makes sense. Okay. So uh, uh, the handlock is like with your explanation, like the better deck, I guess, because the druid has like a better chance in the end. Sure. You think handlock well, has a better chance against yeah. this mech shaman than a druid does? Because like druid has, you know, innervate and wild growth. Those those cards no, are good at winning bad matchups. It's, it's no, it's like if you get a win with the handlock, it's probably more important than with the druid because of the remaining matchups. Uh, well, I think uh, with this hand, I think the handlock is has a better chance, pretty much. <laughs> sure. Because like even if you get a wild growth here, Druid no, will man. never beat that hand ever. Exactly. Yeah, Druid. Exactly. Yeah. Whereas like oh, Mech Shaman, or rather handlock, at least have a, has a chance with like um, a Hellfire on turn four, for example. In, in this situation, when I see a dark bomb, I usually go for the Zapomatic. Just saying yeah. because it's very unlikely they have, because you can play the Neutron next turn if they. As you can see, players some free protect. Oh my god. This is a lot of things. Wow. How much does he want to commit into <laughs> Hellfire? Hellfire? <laughs> oh, you go for it, man. You can't play around that stuff. You play Mech Shaman. You gotta do it. Get a man out. Gotta do it. I mean, just say we and <laughs> see what happens. Go you, for you don't Ni Hao. Yeah. Ni Hao, Ni Hao. Ni hao That's ni of course the... I'm sure Shigara <laughs> has a lot of experience with that. It's like the Chinese version of Hello. Or ni Hao, Hao Ni Hao. Good accent, Gara. I'm proud of you. We, we just we just came uh, came back from Valencia, and then it, it was like, um, hola, 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 hola. It's good stuff. Uh, again, a lot of uh, aggro decks in Valencia <laughs> because of uh, green sheep and blackout bring like f almost full aggro lineups. Yeah, but you you have to play it. At least one. Because if there's a hellfire, you have to play the the shredder. You will never get the zapomati guard. And then there's the sludge bird show potential and stuff. Well, he doesn't have that many cards in hand. You know, one criticism I've heard about players in the Archon Team League is that they play maybe too safely. For example, Trump, when he lost 05 with his Paladin deck, a lot of players and a lot of viewers were maybe criticizing him um, for exactly that. He was just, like, not taking risks. And I think maybe, like, in this Team League format where, like, you're less, where you're, like, playing not just for yourself, but also for the team. Maybe you are um, more like or less likely to take those risks. Maybe you, you're more likely to go for those safer plays. Oh, that's very interesting that he decided to kill the mech warp over the Zapomatic. Well, he's at 28 life and he's got Molten Giants in his deck, so maybe he can take six here. But he has, Get like, if, if, if his board gets somehow dealt with, there's no way he can kill the. At least right now. Ah, he has the Slash Belcher. It's. Uh, uh, it's for sure an interesting play, but as we can see, it was the better play because he had the Zapomatic plus plus Shredder, and he would have definitely went for both if he because he didn't see the Hellfire that last turn. Yeah, so this is actually here. like this looks very good interesting. For, looks very good for Trump. Yeah, he's just playing it slow and steady, which is Whoa, exactly he plays, what he needed to do. He plays yeah, we hex. saw this last time. We saw this last time, and we figured that it might be an anti-handlock measure, and still no. And still no... Um, like, Shaman is one of those classes that oh. can really go for the tempo hex. It's completely fine to hex as much as a Shaman. But you got the spell power, doesn't really matter. You know, what actually could end up happening no is that again. because he went for the Earthshock there instead of the hex, then maybe later on, like, when 
RDU, he might have lethal, but he just like he has to spend three mana on the hex, and he still has to kill that frog instead of just earth shocking, get rid, of, getting rid of a taunt, and going for face. So this is an interesting spot. You really want to play the fire alley on curve, but yeah, you don't like what it's targeting, do you? Face, face. But the, I mean, then are you gonna just put him down to like you lose to shadow flame? Ten damage. You're gonna put him down to eleven and just believe he doesn't have moltens, or I mean, I guess but you have a hex for one molten, so it's, yeah. The thing is, you play mech shaman. Just you yeah, have just to take risks. It. You yeah, have to absolutely. take risks. This is a good play. Even if molten shows up, you hex it and bump it with your annoyatron. You basically lose if your opponent has something, and Trump has nothing right now. Like if he has like molten plus sunfire protector. Then you could deal with the. You have to hex like the Salanas most likely. And that was actually a really weak turn for Trump. That was. Yep. Uh, pretty was happy to see that for sure. But you know what? Still, like Trump still could come back to this with a Shadow Flame in, in the next two draws, and he will have two draws. The hex is so huge as well. So I guess now we hex the Solanus because we're not fearing uh, Molten Giant anymore. You can hex and yes. even... I mean, he knows he doesn't have a Shadow Flame at this point. He would have 100% Shadow Flame last turn. So you can yeah. just like develop it, uh, the Yeti and hex the Sylvanas. And he knows that he has no Moltens, probably. Yep. So, yeah. It's crazy. Like, hexing the Sylvanas also plays around like a top deck Shadow Flame as well. Yeah. Because he wouldn't be able to clear the final Mental otherwise. Any merit to like Cogmaster Totem instead of Yeti? Not really. No. You definitely want that extra five toughness. Yeah. Maybe. Because of Shadow Flame. That's it. That's a bummer. Sapomatic too strong. Yeah, that's that did a lot of damage. Yeah, and it was. I think it was a, a lot about like Trump was really afraid of the Mech Warper instead of respecting the the uh, Zapomatic, which got in at least 12 damage, I believe. But yeah. and like, if he actually like, if he kept the Mech Warper alive, it actually wouldn't have changed any of uh, any of RDU's no. plays. I think they both played right, like perfect. It's just it's a good game. Yeah, you draw double Mech Warper, double Zapomatic. What can the poor handlock do? Yeah. Yeah, I was actually fairly surprised that the game was as close as it was. Because, like, we had said, if Trump or if Value Town Q drew it into that, it would be like a 0% win rate. Right? Yeah, that was a, just a god draw against Druid and just in general a god draw from the Mech Shaman. Mm -hmm. I mean, if the he had four, a Shadow four. Flame yeah, or Molten Giants, he, he maybe had a chance to come back, but with this hand, there was like just no way. And this Druid, just, this and Druid couldn't way. have. Like, even theoretically, Druid couldn't even draw anything. Maybe like a turn free Dr. Boom or something. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> and you know what? We're down to uh, the last two decks, and it's going to be pretty much a complete mirror matchup. Yeah, this was very expected so far with the like the, the, the Hunter getting a win, the Shaman getting a win. This is now getting like very interesting. Yeah. And I think the most interesting part is I think both these, uh, the two sets of decks are pretty much exactly the same, except. Um, Value Town only has two BGHs, one in each of their decks, and Nilim has four BGHs across two decks. So it might not be like that big of a difference as we were making it out to and, be. And even Double Owl. Yeah, Double Owl. And as Life well. Codes, which is like an exception. So they're really prepared for their handlock mirror, mirror and just to counter it in general. So Nihilum's got a big advantage because of the way they uh, prepared for this spot. They wanted to bully Trump's handlock. And maybe Kibler's Mech Shaman and those Fell Reavers. And it's, it's playing out according to plan. Yeah, really, like everything went to according to plan so far. Yeah. I, I would have to think it's not only like, I, I don't think the advantage is honestly that big for Nolum at this point. It's more of like the psychological advantage in the sense that, like, I think Value Town knows at this point that they're being targeted and that their opponent's strategy is working. Right? I feel like the double big game hunter is a very big real advantage against handlock. Like that's that's like the biggest swing card in the game, right? Big game hunter, three mana destroy your crucial minion and develop a medium sized body, medium to small. Yeah, fair yeah. Enough, fair but enough. it's still Hearthstone. Might be that like you play one BGH, but you draw your BGH, and your opponent doesn't plays plays double BGH and doesn't draw a BGH. Would you say Nihilum's more or less than like? 60-40 to win. Yeah. 
On PayPal, it is. I, I think it's around 60 40. Um, that, that's how, like, how I would value the matchups because I think the Druid is probably like in the Druid mirror, I think Dog has a slight advantage, but in every other matchup, how they queue up, uh, I think Nilim does have the advantage. And the other thing to consider is because Life Coach is bringing two BGHs in his handlock, does that make his matchup against Dog worse? Right? Sure. You, yeah, like when you look at it that way, it might actually be even then, right? Because uh, Melu Town's Druid is like slightly stronger because of the anti handlock text. Yeah. I think Dog will also be like considering when he's playing, like if he has a chance to perhaps innervate out a Dr. Boom on turn four, for example, like he might consider like going for the Ancient of Lore instead, just because he knows he scouted it out that both these decks have double VGH. Uh, and we're going to see a Druid versus Warlock here f between Tice and Trump. Now, you mentioned it also, like, I think uh, Druid definitely, like, in, in stats-wise, I think the, the Warlock is slightly favored, but because both players, like, are aware that it's Handlock and not Zoo, um, Tice can just mulligan for those BGHs. He can mulligan for those Keepers of the Grove. And not just that, um, I feel like there are some cards that you can add to Druid besides the swing cards that can help the matchup a lot. And one of those cards that I've been hearing a lot about um, from Pose is Azure Drake, because it's one of those cards that help you cycle your deck more into the combos, into Emperor, and into the swing cards. So Mulligan time, we see a Keeper of the Grove. That's pretty good against Warlock. And the rest of this, you probably just throw back, right? Yeah. yeah exactly as predicted. So you're saying stats-wise, the handlock is a favorite against Druid? Yeah, it doesn't seem that way because um, I think, well, as I was alluding to before, like the BGHs feel really bad and the keepers feel really bad. But I think in the long game, the handlock is a favorite, and stats-wise, it's fifty-three percent in favor of handlock. But in this case, uh, the Druid knows he's playing against handlock, so he's always going to keep that big game hunter, not fearing the zoo. And he has the double big game hunter. So this in this particular game, the Druid has but to be a favorite, this, right? This can really be one of those situations. Like, he plays double BGH, and he has the both mountains, but he doesn't draw it. Yeah, I guess uh, looking yeah. at the hands, this looks uh, very scary for the Druid. Yeah. yeah, this just feels so bad. That's that's why Handlock is such a strong deck, right? Because you play the threats, and your opponent has to have the answer. And it's like, with Handlock, it's always more likely to have the threat than your opponent the answer. Do you shade or it's wild like, growth? Probably yeah, shade. That's a good question. You have to coin, so you just shade. What to do? Another thing to consider is, uh, I think Trump will actually go for the Twilight Drake first, um, just to like kind of dodge the uh, the BGH, and also because the Keeper actually like isn't a hundred hundred percent counter to the Twilight Drake, because mm -hmm. Trump uh, rather because Tice can't fit the hero power in. Right, that's oh, an excellent never point. Mind. I think because of the wild growth play, that might change again, because right. Tice because wants access the... to 6 mana next turn. Now you can keep her coin hero power to clear yep. it fully. Or is it better to cycle the Wrath than to hero power? The Wrath's pretty good with Azure Drake. Yeah, that's a good point. You can clear off some of the uh, annoying slimes, perhaps. Yeah, I like this slightly better. Hmm. And we're going to see Trump, uh, he's going to be able to go into double Mountain Giant. Um, I'm sure like he's very apprehensive and nervous about this play, though, because he knows his opponent does have those double BGHs. Man, if he would played that Giant last turn, this would be a very different game. Drew would be under a lot more pressure. Yeah, I don't think that's a play like you generally make, though. Like I think all Handlock players are so experienced that they instantly know which of the big threats to play on turn four. And I think in that scenario, I think... I think I like the giant yeah. there. Yeah, it's got a higher upside when it works. They're both equally mm -hmm. likely to not work, but uh, with the coin and the wild growth, the keeper kind of lines up just fine with the Drake that turn. So you might as well yeah. go for the higher upside. I guess, I guess it's sort of like the higher risk play to play the giant first, mm -hmm. which maybe he feels like he's got a good hand. He doesn't want to take risks. Mm -hmm. The other thing to consider is uh, because he played the 
Actually, it doesn't really matter. But I think the other thing to consider is the 4-2 is a stronger body than the 2-4. That result would result from the BGH. So he might be afraid of that as well. He did have Dark Bomb to deal with the BGH on the following turn, right? Mm -hmm. But if he Dark Bomb on the following turn, he wouldn't be able to play a threat on the same turn. Wow, this is a crushing it, turn. Mountain it, Giant, clear your Magic Drake, hit you in the face for eight. Can he come back from this, the Druid? Probably not. What would need to happen? But this, I really want to like um, touch on the the turn where he decided to hero power over Wrath because you all agree that it's like a better play. And in general, I would also agree. But he doesn't have the BGH in his hand right now, so like the turn where he could cycle the Wrath, isn't it like yeah. better to to dig deeper into the deck to try to find the the BGH? I, I think. Because, um, yeah, I think uh, given the position now, it is. But he couldn't have known that Trump would have yeah. double. Mountain Giant yeah, in yeah. his hand. But he can't oh, answer. Even one. Yeah, even one. He can't answer it, so that's why I'm really curious. But Tyson's like the experienced uh, drill player, so it's probably like correct to high play it. But I mean, that's really frustrating, right? To not have the BGH and he has the double mountain. But this is what I was like talking about earlier. It can happen. Yeah, this is just the god draw. And these things just happen. Um, and he has everything, like the law tip to seal the game and stuff. Yeah. Because after the law tip, there's not much uh, Druid can do anymore. Yeah. Sweet Tyson is still completely top. dead. <laughs> I was about to yeah. say that. Yeah, MC Tech is like surprisingly like not too terrible against Handlock because they very often they have like all these like they have more than four four or more minions on the board. And you know what? Handlock is one of those decks that plays Doctor Boom as well. Mm. Do you like the Argus over the MC uh, law tip Sun Fury? I, I like was, the Lothab Sun Fury. I think, uh, I don't know, you might want to play a bid around Black Knight even in this scenario. Mm. It, just when was the last so time you saw a Black Knight? I mean, the, the thing is, like, these are anti Druid decks or anti Handlock decks, so Black Knight kind of makes sense. Yeah. And I believe, like, the last time I saw Black Knight was actually used by Purple Drank, I think, your teammate. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Oh. Uh, but can he avoid to die? He has no, taunt not. plus BGH. And he has to use everything to kill the second guy. Exactly. The second giant. What if he gets uh, the bluegill warrior that makes it a lot cleaner to kill off a giant? Um, or a flame tongue totem, dire wolf, perhaps. Looks yeah, looks right. like Trump is one damage of lethal if he goes for that play. If he got flame tongue totem there, he was really punished by his positioning with the shredder, right? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I really I like start, start to pay more attention about that myself. Just you know, place. yeah, exactly. And you know what? Like, if we, if Tice had gone for the play that you mentioned, going for the wrath instead of the hero power, you he would have oh. gotten that BGH. Oh. Or rather, sorry, uh, yeah, Tice. He would have gotten the uh, BGH one turn earlier, pretty much. Is it correct to life tab? Hellfire is lethal. Owl is lethal. I mean, just everything is lethal, right? Yeah, right. So you, Probably you, tap. Otherwise, you if can you, Argus. If you don't get anything, uh, you're still like have a really good turn on like for six mana. Like you have some yeah. choice. Mm -hmm. You go watch your Argus. Your Lotheb eats his bear. Your Sun Fury trades with his BGH. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You have yeah. a huge watcher taunt it up. And then you just have inevitability on your side, pretty much. Like, you're gonna draw into one of those spells eventually. I might as well just slam down that Ragnaros and go face. <laughs> I might as well win there. <laughs> Miss Lethal. Yeah, Twitch chat's definitely saying that. Wow, he does face. That's greedy, right? A little bit. I was gonna trade, but I mean, whatever. It's gonna work, right? I think, uh, like, this Trump, like, hand. maybe realized that. He couldn't die to force a nature savage war combo, so he went for that play. But is that actually correct? Seven. Yeah, it's, he wouldn't die. Hmm. Six. It would be uh, yeah. he, it's only fifteen damage. In. Yeah, exactly. He's two. Uh, he has two more health than it needs. The combo would only do fifteen damage to face. But from Tice's position, like it, from his perspective, it looks like he can stabilize 
for this turn, as long as Trump has absolutely nothing in his hands. Which will not last long. Uh, having two life doesn't usually work out against the deck with Hellfire and Dark Bomb and such. Yeah. Especially because like decks these days, they run double Hellfire, double Dark Bomb. So four cards of the remaining, let's say, uh, 20 cards in Trump's deck will just kill him. Getting some Savage War value, though. Good play. You know, you, Tice. Yeah, you know what? If Trump absolutely has nothing in his hand, then there's a possibility that Tice could win. Oh, turn that Bon Boom Bot lethal easy. <laughs> easy. <laughs> easy. Frag is lethal again. I don't think that's the kind of lethal you want to take. Yeah. This, this is, is a good play. Cool, yeah, he saw one BGH. He couldn't deal with the first two yeah. giants. I have two more. <laughs> And at this point, you can see Tice like nodding his head, like he accepts his fate here. Like, it's just kind of inevitable. Lethal. Good play. Never misses lethal. Exactly. And Trump, like you can see, like he. he uh... That was a huge win for Benjamin. Yeah, that was so huge. Yeah. Like especially because like I think Trump was like kind of like he, he, in the games that he lost, pretty much. First of all, in the game with um, against Life Coach Control Warrior versus Handlock. He made kind of a misplay, or you could argue it was a misplay, where he went for face and he activated the Molten Giants, and he, I think he was kind of blaming himself for that. And also in that game um, against Life Coach, Handlock versus Patron Warrior, like he like he was kind of like uh, in some ways like making fun of like how Life Coach was roping, but he played his turn so quickly that maybe he didn't consider every possibility, and he kind of lost a game in which I think he thought that he was like ninety five percent chance to win. Yeah, Patron's an explosive deck. It can blow you up. And uh, Life Coach was kind of sending all the signals by going face and then playing Emperor that he was setting up lethal. And uh, Trump maybe just missed a very difficult opportunity to spot by dark bombing yeah. face to prevent the weapon swing. Yeah, so once again, Nilium is uh, kind of down in the ropes. and But the one difference here is that RDU has actually like played all of his decks. So he's not going to be the anchor here this time. It's it's still anybody's game because no. there's a, there's two druids involved. <laughs> I'll go with the innervate. Let's go. Yeah, dogs a it's very actually, good druid player. <laughs> this actually seems like a pretty common scenario, actually, where like the two druids are the last decks remaining, right? We saw it in um, in Archon versus uh, versus Tempo Storm, and also in a few other ones in Liquid versus Cloud Nine, for example. This should be a good game. Tice versus Dog, both known for excellent druid play. Yeah, uh, it's pretty much uh, Tice, Dog, and like Strife Crow, who are known for like being the druid players. Actually, Dr Dog was known for being ramp most of the time. He made like a lot of ramp versions popular, but that kind of died off. Yeah, that's a lot. I think of he was. Us. That's good. back in the day. He was mostly known for like one combo, I believe, instead of like the double combo that pretty much everyone uses these days. Oh, he looks like Doc didn't get it because he was shaking his head. I liked Wild Growth better. I like, sorry, I like the single combo versions more in the past than I do now. Oh. I think with Emperor, double combo becomes a lot stronger. Oh man, that hand from Dark is frustrating. Oh, wow, he's playing Wild Growth like, for the Tempo BGH. It's even more interesting. I think it's uh, acceptable because are we gonna uh, see he has double two BGHs? I guess. Are we gonna see double Tempo BGH? Yeah, Both I sides. think if you like, if you cut the beach or if you add a second BGH, I guess you're like cutting a shade in your deck. So he's like kind of act like it seems like this is a sh he's making this look like a shade, I guess. Now, or is there any way you like don't play something this turn, intending to keep her that four two next turn? You might actually even savage draw. I mean, he has only one BGH, right? He I like saving the savage draw because you have that emperor. You could do some really explosive stuff yeah. if you find yeah, a force yeah, yeah. in nature. But he has also the keeper for the for that BGH. And he has to play the keeper probably next turn. Well, you could play the big game hunter and uh, just hope he goes face with his big game hunter. And then you get the keeper punished. Do you think there's any chance yeah. it plays out that way? Looks not. like he's yeah. just gonna... Your power. It's funny, there's so many like really important decisions this early yeah. in the game. He can actually consider... Which way to go. He, he played he it too actually... fast, right? Because he's thinking yeah. now. Well, he's, he's considering whether he wants to hit the BGH to set up a swipe for next turn. Because this, this I, I, I think that's very valid because Tice coined out the um, 
the wild growth. So it might be more likely that Tice can curve out in the next turn. It's probably the first time I see Dark Robe. Yeah. He's known for being. Whoa. That was a swipe setup? Because yeah, swipe like, he wouldn't Wild Growth for a Tempo BGH if you don't have like a follow up play, right? Exactly, it's exactly. So that was like really had to play by Dog. Yeah, Dog is known for like I think in the, in the his first few tournaments, like when he was just getting on the scene, he played way too fast and made very obvious mistakes. He's really known to be like one of the fastest players. Like he, but he thinks also very fast. It's not like that he just plays fast. But he I've heard him talk about that before. He says part of the reason he plays fast is because on his opponent's turn he's thinking about, okay, if they do this, I'm going to do that. And so he's sort of already thought about it, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Yeah. I'll, but also in the uh, the very beginning of Hearthstone, like he told me that he played too fast sometimes because he was just used to playing fast on stream. And like he wasn't used to tournament play. But I think Dog, he's probably played like more tournament games in the past few months than like almost everyone in the scene, save like five people perhaps. See, I'm sort of the opposite. I'm more like life coach. I grew up playing chess, and I'm used to just like four-hour games. Let's do it. I just sit there and think for half an hour on one move. So the the rope's kind of a bummer for me. Yeah, we've seen that quite often in the the past yeah. few weeks, haven't we? Zoe? I mean, patron, you're gonna rope, no matter how fast you like to play. There are turns where it's literally impossible to do the things. But back to the game. Oh. Good emperor turn. What do you think? Uh, this... There's not really much anything else. But even if you emperor, I think you're just dead. I, yeah, I kind of forget what's in Tice's hand, but he has um, if your goal. opponent, yeah, if your opponent like charges a Druid of the Claw into your face and you're at 14 health, like you're probably dead. Yeah. And he's just respecting that. He's hoping like with this line of play that he can like chain these taunts up. And very often, like as we mentioned, Black Knight isn't a card these days that anyone runs. So like it's very likely that this Ancient of War will tank the full 10 damage. Just want to point out that Doctor Boom is green, Ooh. Okay. but he doesn't go for it. Today's been a day with a lot of um, like people really think things through and make some not obvious plays that are pretty good. Yeah, I'm really enjoying this match. Yeah. So I think with this play, maybe he's selling that he's going. He has the um, the Force of Nature Savage War combo at least part of it in his hand. Taunting up is huge there. That would be so insane if Dark comes back from this, right? Because this is like one of those matchups that are really known for. If you're like behind in tempo in a Druid Mirror, you will just lose like 99% yeah. of the time. P pretty much the only way you can come back into, into the game is your opponent like misses a drop. But we've seen both players, they've been like pretty spot on with drops past turn four. If he goes for the clear, he doesn't develop something. I like this boom. Yeah, yeah, you have to get yeah. for the boom. And also, like, I don't think this is a game where Dog can come back because of the Ancient of Lore in Tice's hand. Like, if he didn't have that Ancient of Lore, it was a possibility that like Dog could draw the game out, but not anymore. Next turn, he can go for the Lore draw and innovate Savage Draw. He has like three, three draws to find Savage Draw. So can we like big game innovate Emperor here? It seems like the strongest play. Yeah. What? And you know what? If, if he does that, then there's a possibility that like he has the Force of Nature double Savage Roar combo in a later that turn. Sick. Oh. That would be so sick. But like, if, even if he did that, he would have to wait for two more turns because Force of Nature without an Emperor uh, reduction plus oh, yeah. double Savage Roar is still 10 mana. But that's really something Doc needed. Like a B. Uh, yeah for gaining the tempo back to like a Dr. Boom that he can be the age, but Dr. Boom is still so scary. Might still be lethal. Okay, so he's going, f okay, so he's really playing around uh, Savage Roar here. I think he was playing around it in that turn where the, where he played the Druid of the Claw instead of the Emperor. So he goes for the same line of play here, just, I guess, being consistent. Just like, just really oh man, too. that is, that is, just, yeah, that sucks. Well, it's kind of okay that the Boombot did that because oh. it very easily could have just won the game. Is that lethal? Force Nature does a lot of damage. Yeah, with the Wrath, it's yeah, lethal. it's it's rough. Ah, yeah. oh, quick game here. And you know what, Druid versus Druid, probably not the most exciting matchup. Um, 
It's probably one of my least favorite to cast simply because we do know who wins usually in the first like two or three turns. But, but, yeah, but most people say actually that the patron mirror is even worse. Yeah. Because there's like nothing you can do. If someone goes for the like turn five, six patrons, you have no like you usually don't have an answer and it's like over. Oh, you usually don't have an answer, but you can go for um, you can just try and lethal yep. in with the war song frothy play. Yeah. Sometimes you buy just enough time to do that. Yeah, like it's usually you don't win or you you don't come back, but when the times you do come back, it's like it makes for exciting games at least, right? I actually really like that Druid Mirror. I thought there were a lot of uh, interesting decisions made by the players. Yeah. They were like not that obvious and pretty good. Um, back to the Patron Mirror. Uh, one common mistake is when the opponent makes a bunch of patrons. A lot of times, clearing them is just like never going to win for you. And you'll see people make that mistake. They'll try and clear the other patrons when it's never going to work. And what they have to do to try to win is uh, set up a War Song Frothy Lethal. Yep. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, unfortunately, like there's no, going to be no patrons in the next match, and it's going to be Dog's Druid uh, against Life Coach's Handlock. And as we mentioned previously, the Handlock is actually slightly favored in that matchup. But then again, like Dog knows that his opponent will be playing Handlock, so that's more of an advantage to him. Also, uh, Life Coach's Handlock is like slightly teched in the mirror uh, again with the double BGH. So again, that's an, another advantage for Dog. So that would I'd be have actually... to give Dog the favorite here. That would be actually interesting stats, like how much it improves the Druid win ratio when you know, like against what type of handlock you uh, or warlock you play. Yeah, definitely. I think, uh, like you can just like kind of think about it because like the only thing that would really change is you keep the BGHs in your deck or in your hand, so you can kind of like think about it, like if I just keep the BGH on Mulligan, what are the chances that I have the BGH when my opponent plays mm. the giant? You can just like but factor that in, kind of. But that's such a big difference as we saw like in the Trump game. Just not having the BGH when he plays the turn four giant. Just game deciding. Yeah, exactly. And not, not only that, but um, Tice knew that his opponent was handlocked. Yeah. Like hard mulligan for the BGHs as well. So it's like, it's even more upsetting that he never got them. And this match is so close. 5-5. Five, five. It's been close, I feel like, the whole way. Like the, fur the biggest lead was what? 3-1 to one at the start or something? And since then, it's just nail biters the whole way. Lots and of even close the, games. Big yeah, even decks. the last match, right? It's still anybody's game. I have to feel like uh, Nylum's favored just because it's the way things have been going, right? But you're cheering for Value Town here because you don't want Nylum to have a 4-0 record. Like, if they get a 4-0 record, like, it's probably... Like, it's going to be very hard to catch up to them. Uh, although, they're, they'll still have, like, not a great game differential score because again like they've gone 6-5 almost every time right this could be like the closest series of all in Arkham League so far yeah I mean we've seen a couple of other 6-5s but it's like this series has just been really back and forth and in a lot of the other 6-5s it's like this one deck just couldn't get a win whereas this uh, in this match pretty much like they've been trading wins it would be cooler to see Value Town win, just to make it like the, the standings as close as possible. Yeah, you gotta root for the underdog, right? I mean, they're a very yeah. slight underdog, but still. Yeah. Man, this is like one versus two, game 11. Doesn't get much better than this. Yeah. I think uh, actually going into like the entire team league, uh, Nalem was like one of the favorites. Value Town, like some people didn't think of them as one of the favorites because. Like, first of all, they weren't, like, a cohesive team before. And also, like, made, a lot of people thought Kibler was, like, kind of the weak link, having, like, performed not that well in Torrance. But I think uh, everyone's opinions of Kibler has, like, certainly switched around in the past few weeks. Yeah, master of duels so far. Nothing to scoff at. A great performance, right? Even also, like, bringing Shaman, right? Which where most people consider, like, the weakest class right now. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And he's just showing that it's... Like, so many upsets, right? That's impressive, yeah. So, um, what was your favorite game so far, Kara, from this match? From this match? Um, honestly, in terms of skill, probably like the Druid. I, I think the Druid Mirror. I think that yeah, the, the hero power... The, the, the hero power on the BGH, right, from Dog. I think that's like a really insane play. Yeah. Like, how often how do you see something like that? And how obvious was the coin while growth intending to tempo BGH? I guess that's like fairly standard. Yeah. Mm. Is it? 
Probably, yeah. Yeah. Just curve out. Uh, it's a game. Yeah. My favorite when you play game double was actually, like, Yeah. Oh, yeah, no, My no, no. Game... The, yeah, yeah, the, the, the yeah. Control, so, yeah, control Warrior versus Handlock that was, like, the sickest game yeah. so far. Definitely. But actually, like, my favorite play of the whole series probably was uh, pretty much... Probably, like, Kibler's turn four play, where he went for, like, Flame Tongue Totem into um, just hero power instead of playing the very obvious coin fell reaver um, because that like actually like determined the game completely and first of all it let Kibler get an undefeated record and then it also like uh, set up the entire pace of the entire series and it was a very like not obvious play a play that could only be made by a player that practices a lot of mech shaman which obviously Kibler does for this league. But that goes same this for the, the patron win from life coach that set up like that whole game how he set up that kill was also insane. Like, so every turn was, like, insane. By him. We're watching Druid against Handlock, not Rogue for Smage, right? Yes. That's wow, right. that's a pretty good Druid start. Is it the right start for this matchup, though? Innervate Shade, it kind of gets out of Hellfire range. Yeah. Yeah, it's all... <laughs> but you get a card disadvantage. Right. But does that matter yeah. if you win? I've actually oh, heard from win, some... Okay. I think I've actually heard from some Druid players that uh, you actually don't want Innervate in your opening hand against Handlock. And that sounds kind of crazy to me. I don't know if you guys have opinions about that. I've heard that. I've heard that you sometimes want to keep Innervate for uh, bursting against Handlock. Also, let me ask you, is there any chance you like Innervate Shredder on 2 into Shade on 3 for a curve instead of going for the turn 1 Shade that's too big for Hellfire? I think um, in some matchups you can do that, but it's just like the Hellfire scenario where like it's just way too much value from a Hellfire yeah. if they kill off a 4-3 and a Shade. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, I think it's too important to get the Shade out of Hellfire range, then you can leave it up as long as you want, basically. There's a little buggy here. Yeah, we can't really see what's going on. We see a lot of Shades and Shredders and Drakes. I see the Druid's cards. Like before the mulligan, I saw a rope tick, but I haven't seen the handlocks in. Yeah, we also kind of like ha have to hype up this match in that dog and uh, dog and life coach are two of the most successful players in Block Rock Mountain. Uh, dog has like a fifty six percent win rate in Block Rock Mountain, and life coach has a fifty five percent win rate, and they're like both like top five or top, at least top six in Block Rock Mountain. That's kind of um, whoa. The numbers are okay. We got a game going. This is good. So he did so, not innervate out the shade. He decided to save yeah. the innervate for burst maybe later on in the game. Oh, uh, so he innervated out a. No, no he, I think huh? he innervated out a shredder, and then he drew yeah. a second innervate. Yeah. Right. Only that makes sense because he has free mana. So he has to play shade here, right? He's going to just play into the coin yeah. fire. That feels so bad. And then you can, oh. yeah, you can still like innovate sh um, Lord Tap next turn. But it's just better to play the Shade now than than oh, later. Oh wow! I, yeah, I think he's like way too scared of the Hellfire. That's like, like we're just hyper aggressive. I think like his hand kind of like dictates that he goes this aggressive though, because he doesn't playing... have like any draw, and he like he's used both innovates already. Yeah, but he's playing around the coin Drake here with that play. Okay. Yeah, the Lotus is, is key for denying Coin Drake. It's funny, one play seems so obvious, but there's always things to think about. So, so that's I like the Ancient Watcher here. Yeah, you can't life tap because you will all draw. So that's just the Watcher play, there's nothing else. Okay, this one is actually a simple play. Good. But, but maybe he's thinking about like the whole, because you the have only picture. 70 seconds for one turn, he might be thinking about the next turn or something. Well, he can also yeah, be exactly. thinking just to bluff, just to disguise his hand. I mean, it's the, it's, it's the determining game, right, of the series. Yeah, this is might for all the marbles. Might as well think a little bit. Previous 10 games are a push, this is what matters. Oh, wow! My God. That is, okay. That like second innovate into Savage Raw was like ridiculous. If he doesn't have a Shadow Flame, it... Oh, Hellfire will be... Might be... Well, like, 
what we were saying before, um, you sometimes like ha some players have said that you want to save your innervates for the Savage Roar combo. But now that both innervates have been have been used, Life Coach uh, certainly has a lot fewer things to think about. Like on turn seven, Life Coach won't be afraid it's, of the combo at it's, all. It's so important what comes out of the Shredder. If you Hellfire, do you just die to Savage Roar? Only if, only if there's like two or three attack on the minion that comes out because you have seven. You need seven, twelve damage, and you have seven plus three, eleven. No, yeah, I think you, you just need, die. You need one damage. No, no, you're dead. Yeah, for sure. You're dead, for sure. If you're healthy, you're dead. So, many so coin he healer. But then you're dead as well, right? Because it's... Um, so yeah, we're seeing dead. the advantage of how uh, of Dog's aggressive play. Um, he puts so much pressure on that he's not even scared of yeah, that, Hellfire anymore. He but that only works if you have the Savage Roar. So is there any way for um, Life Coach to survive? Maybe an Argus here? I mean, he has a couple like different defensive plays, right? He has the heal bot, or the hellfire, or the torn. But which one is like? This might be probably the strongest. All right. So what would uh, Savage Roar do? It would do six, eleven, fourteen That's damage. 14. So, yeah, so dog is. Well, it's one damage off lethal, right? Eight plus six plus hero power. Oh yeah, no, 15. no, it is no, it's it's fifteen. Yeah, it's fifteen. Yeah, it's, it's it's lethal, one hundred percent. Why is he? Not, does he actually think he's one damage off? Like this? Maybe he's just quintuple counting. He's like, this is for everything. I have time. I'll just count and make sure I'm doing everything right. Uh, right yup, yeah. still lethal. Yeah, I mean, there's only one card that you can play and, now. And, whoa, he doesn't see it. No, no, he sees it. He no, sees right, it. He's okay, just he's right, just right. slow rolling a little bit. It's okay. He, he, he just looked. He looked so sad, right? He looked. Life coach is like, man. He he looked. Oh man, that wow! Life coach is really wow. Crushed. Dog took such an aggressive line of play, and it totally paid off for him. That was amazing. Sometimes the stars align. <laughs> yeah. And unfortunately, uh, no team right now is like undefeated in uh, the Archon team league. Uh, both of these teams go down to or go up to at least. Uh, two and or three and three two and right one. now, three no three and okay three and one yeah you're right yeah which is like they're tied for first place at least so that's something that's going well for them at least are these that's the only two teams series. at three and one yeah until more yeah. games are played well of course Archon and Forsten boys they uh, have the opportunity to go to three and one to, uh, either today or tomorrow that'll sort of be, certainly be a very exciting series. But uh, as we can see, like again, all the teams are like pretty close. Um, of course, Value Town and Nilhum will get an early lead, but there's still three more matches the uh, for the remainder of the week. So, do we have a video coming up? Um, well, I, not right now. I think we're let's uh let's go over the match first a bit. I think okay. uh, both teams were like they played really well. So a lot of heads up plays throughout this entire series. Um, from Life Coach, his handlock play was like pretty immaculate. Um, even though Trump's Control Warrior was in the end able to beat it, I was really impressed with his play overall. He, he was his uh, patron play was also really good. Um, wh what other players? Kibler, I mentioned his Mech Shaman play, especially that turn four um, play where he didn't coin out the Fell Reaver was really good. Dog, mm -hmm. even though he lost that Druid Mirror, I thought his uh, swipe or his setting up the swipe turn was really good as well. There's overall like a lot of heads up stuff from players, and I really like to see that in this type of league where players are, they're just like really playing their best. So everything, a lot of skill, a lot of top decks. <laughs> yeah, I, I I really enjoyed this series because I felt like there were so many close, interesting decisions that really mattered and really changed the outcome of games. Uh, spots like not dark bombing face uh, with handlock against patron to prevent the weapon swing. Spots like uh, setting handlocks to 10 life and seeing the double molten giant Argus Healbot punish. There were um, things about, like, do you cycle the Wrath to try and draw into BGH? Uh, there were a lot of great moments in this match that really yeah. showed that Hearthstone's not just RNG, but the skill and decision-making just has a huge impact. Yeah, definitely. 
Um, I think uh, that does it for the match today. Um, we're going to have another match for you right after this, but I think we're going to be joined with a few new casters, so I'm going to have to say bye to Zalay and Gar for now. Do you guys have any like closing thoughts for the day? Thanks for having me. It was fun. Yeah, same for me. I really enjoyed the series, and have fun for the next one. Yeah, so um, I think that's it for now. So we'll be taking a short break, setting up the match for the, the next match, and we'll be right back right after these messages. <laughs>